you have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. You don't need a TV. Hello and welcome to TV Guidance Counselor. I am Ken Reed, your TV Guidance Counselor, and I am very excited for my guest this week. This is by far the longest episode I've ever recorded, but I think it's very interesting. The smartest man in the world himself, Mr. Greg Proops. I really, really like talking to Greg, as you will be able to tell when you hear this uh, episode. We, we get into a lot of uh, rather obscure knowledge about uh, the Twilight Zone and weird pulp authors and all kinds of things that I that I really enjoy. It's, uh, it's a little academic, but uh, what else would you expect? Uh, you know, that's what you're here for. Uh, if you're listening to the show for the first time because you are a Greg Proops fan, uh, this show is sort of atypical of how the show normally is. It's always entertaining, but normally someone picks an uh, exact issue of TV Guide from a specific week. We sit down, we go through night by night what they would listen to, uh, what they would watch that week, rather. And uh, it's a little more specific. With Greg, we got a little more heady. We got a little more off topic, but interesting nonetheless. So I think you'll enjoy it. Please sit back, relax, and listen to this week's episode of TV Guidance Council with my guest, Greg Proops. Mr. Greg Proops, Greg, thanks so much for doing the show. Hello, Ken. Hello, everybody. Hello, Hello people in TV Guideland. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're quite welcome. Uh, I grabbed sort of a selection for you based on uh, past experience and what the general age is of people usually pick. Uh, and you instantly gravitated towards a 1969 issue there with Raymond Burr on the cover. Well, I, I, my theory is that the shows that you watch between like six and ten, and I think you said as much to me before we started, yeah. are really the shows that you remember your rest of your life. I was, I feel like I was lucky because uh, when I was little, uh, we had the Adams Family, Batman, right. Star Trek, and the Avengers, and right. those were all my childhood. And I don't think there's been. Uh, and Man from Uncle, yeah. Wild Wild West. Uh, it was a great time for fantasy on television. Yeah, and uh, really cinematic stuff oh, too. Yeah, really exciting and sexy and like I I don't think the TV holds up as well now as far as that kind of um, escapism and fantasy. No, especially not for kids. I right. mean, that age group. You get fantasy now. It's like Game of Thrones, and it's like yeah, yeah, it's yeah. good, but then there's a bunch of boobs and no, I was gonna uh, say, really and, good and sexual violation. Yeah, yeah. I mean for Avengers, you know, the Avengers. We that was about as titillating as it would get as a kid. You're like, I don't understand why I like this. But, right, uh, right. I knew that she was hot. And also, they had an edict to, to have no reality in the show. Yeah. The Avengers had a, a serious show Bible. I yeah. don't even think they were allowed to have black people on the show, and I'm not kidding. Right, right. I Well, it's England, too. No I don't policemen, think, either. Yeah. They were never allowed to show a policeman. I don't think... Because then it would have taken the sex out. I don't think England got black people till like, 1978, anyway. Um, this is going to freak you out, but um, uh, I was in the BBC... Uh, uh, several years ago and there were some albums lying around right. uh, in the studio this is the one on Portland Street and one of them was a double fold out album of a TV minstrel show that oh ran yeah the into black the and white minstrel yep, show yep yep and I was like when is this from and they're like the 70s oh yeah I think it went to like 1982 yeah yeah people blacked up on TV then yeah and, and you just think oh holy cow it's insane that yeah. that happened yeah. I they really didn't get black people in England till like it was probably the late 60s well I mean they, they always had black people but, but they like, never certainly put them on no, television no or as like a culture more part of the culture oh no I think. no they never i yeah. mean what did roger moore say this week idris elba can't be james bond because he's right. not english english right right and that's right. code for he's black right. exactly even though he's uh, sexy and dashing and has and all would the be elements. perfect of course it'd be perfect he's got a stentorian voice and yeah all that. well speaking of uh of him the saint was on at that time and that the saint was on well. them too and uh, my father loved all these shows uh, yeah uh, uh star trek mission impossible um there was just a zillion shows that we watched. So did you? Did your dad laughing. introduce you to all this stuff, or did you have siblings, or are you only child? Uh, I, well, my sister was seven years older than me. Okay, so, so you weren't watching stuff with her. She was a teenager, uh, and yeah, she had her. By by that point, she was sort of out every night. Right, right, right. Uh, going to San Francisco and uh, seeing concerts and stuff like that. Yeah, her whole room was covered with uh, psychedelic posters and yeah. uh, late '60s San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so she. Uh, she uh, she was not watching this much telly. My dad introduced me. My dad let me stay up to watch Star Trek because it was right. on at ten o'clock on Thursday night, and okay. that when it first started, and it, so that was really late. 
uh, for how old I was. Right, right, absolutely. But he didn't care, and he let me stay up because he knew that I was desperate to see it. Was he into sci-fi and fantasy and stuff, or that was just what was going on at the time? I think he, more that it was just going on at the time, and, right. and he thought the show was fun. You yeah. know, uh, his taste ran toward um, war movies. Okay, yeah, he's westerns. a dad. Yeah, <laughs> it's war and westerns. Yep. That's like the the eternal dad things that Isn't they it? like. <laughs> Especially at that time. I remember uh, uh, there was a book from the 80s and it had like the dad channel and it's just Merrill's Marauders, uh, you know, Battle Mission of Impossible. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah Nothing yeah. but war shows. Yeah, Zulu. Was still, yeah, Zulu always. Was, Zulu is like, it, Zulu. There, if it's a Sunday afternoon, there's at least a thousand dads in the world watching Zulu. Any day. It doesn't matter what decade. I watched it again. I br- uh, was on the bus with the improv guys, the Who's Line guys, a couple years ago and I brought only men's films and I showed them all and everybody sat wrapped. Bridge on the long River Kwai. Right Canada, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, it was Bridge on the River yep. Kwai and Zulu. Yeah, guys, just we just sat like this. Yeah, like just you have men to can watch it over chair. and over. Oh yeah, it yeah. never gets old. Women are like, um, this is horribly violent, and they're yeah. just killing black people for like a year, and you're like, shh, this we're is about to win the British Empire. Here. Film, yeah, it's a good film. Yeah, so. Your, your dad, did you have a lot of questions about any of this stuff? I mean, I yeah, imagine it was kind of uh, weird. I mean, when my dad spoke German, so when we'd watch um, anything that had, uh, you know, war, war movies he right. loved, World War II. Uh, so I'd go, what do they say? What do they say the whole time? Right, right, he right. would translate for me. Was he ever like, that's not real German? Um, <laughs> no, you know, because his, his wasn't like fluent. Right, right, right. He, because he spoke Yiddish, and Yiddish is all German. Yeah. He, he did speak German enough to uh, get by. Uh, I would ask him, qu- I remember watching a documentary once about the Borgias or Popes or something, and I said, but everybody in this is evil. Who are the good guys? And right. he went, sometimes there's no good guys. Whoa. And that was the first concept, time I was introduced to the concept. How old were you? Eight. Yeah, seven or that's eight. about the right age like, to introduce the went, concept like, of the human condition to people. Yeah, he went, they're, they're not, n- nobody's nice in this, yeah. in this case. And I was like, but I've been taught that there's good and yeah, bad. There's white hats and black hats. Always, yeah. always. And they were nope. still on that. There were still westerns on TV Absolutely. Uh, in the 60s, and there were still war shows. Yeah. Uh, combat, like, oh, I think I might have even mispronounced it, Merrill's Marauders. That only lasted yeah. one year. Wagon Train. Wagon Train. Bonanza. Um, High Chaparral, Bonanza. Yeah. Bonanza was so boring. We never watched it. It really is. And we never watched Gunsmoke. Gunsmoke was pretty boring as well. And you had the Riflemen and all the, the all this kind of shows like that. Chuck Connors, I sort of came back to the Riflemen mm-hmm. later because I knew him from his sort of exploitation work in the late 70s, right, right. like Tourist Trap, yeah. and all these movies where he's just a real sleazy... Soylent Green, Yeah, man. yeah. And so when I watched The Rifleman, I'm like, he's the hero of the show? Yeah. He's a terrifying monster and everything. I'm used right. to seeing I love it. that he's supposed to be this peace-loving, non-violent dude, yeah. but the solution to every week's episode is to shoot a bunch of guys with a rifle. Well, yeah, I mean, as the NRA will tell you, the, th- <laughs> the key to peace is carrying a gun. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a Very gun on you, everybody's power. peaceful. Uh, so his son is a uh, I'm from the show, the cat yeah. who played Lucas, whose name is Johnny something, uh, has a, a full-on orchestra in Los Angeles. Like a really? Society. Yeah, I went to a film event maybe seven, eight years ago, and uh, Hugh Hefner had funded. It was a, a, um, an old picture, and they'd re-scored uh, it and whatnot. A silent movie? Or? Yeah, yeah. and, and he, his band played. That's pretty weird. Yeah, and it was Lucas from The Rifleman, and I'm like, yeah. oh my God. Wait a minute, were yeah, you the yeah. only one that recognized him? Because no, I have that issue. No, not a yeah. doc event, because <laughs> right, right. there's too many old-fashioned viewers yeah. there, but uh, that was what he went up to. Yeah. And, uh, Chuck Connors uh, also had an awesome show called Branded after yes. that, that yeah. we used to reenact the opening of on the playground all yeah. the time, because he, he was slapped across the face, his buttons were t- cut off his tunic, his, his insignia were ripped off, his yeah. epaulets, and they'd break his sword over their knee and then send him out into the desert. Could you think... That seems like the most sci-fi <laughs> element is someone being able to break a sword over their knee. How about that, right? I've, ne- I've never seen anyone attempt that no, other than the branded a opener. I could do that. So that's an interesting thing, too, where you have, you know, in the... In the early 60s and the 50s you have these very you know no pun intended black and white yeah. sort of shows uh, and then in the late 60s and into the 70s they're the same genre but it starts to question things a little more so like the rifleman is pretty straightforward branded is a little more shades of gray you know right. combat really straightforward mash shades of gray Absolutely. and you start to get these sorts of questioning things and I think the, the best example I can think of is uh, the prisoner and secret agent man or whatever it was called in England before that right uh, 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 Secret Agent Man, I remember watching the black and white one with Patrick uh, McNee. No. I always get them confused, too. It's Patrick McGowan. Yeah. Patrick McGee is the one from Clockwork Orange. And, and Patrick, Patrick McNee, McNee is, the is the one from the Avengers. Avengers. Yes. yes. Uh, absolutely, because we watched Secret Agent Man, and then when The Prisoner came on, we watched it all the time. Right. That was a huge show. And that's the first, like you say, 
Secret Agent Man, there's no question that spying is necessary. Yes. It's just a sexy world of, you know, gambling in Macau and yeah. picking up girls with bitchin' hair. It's so James Bond. Right, and smoking and jewels and bad guys with mustaches. And then the prisoner it absolutely questions the role of government. And yeah. the government is, is a horrible, uh, you know, oligarchy run, secret society. He's, he ends up in spy camp. Yeah. Where... You've got to be debriefed because you know too much. Yes, and it's that's the first show I can think of that was, you know, for lack of a better term, a mind fuck. It is. That is the like the original mind fuck. It show. still holds up too. It I don't know really how he does. got Lord Grey to make that show. I don't either. He convinced him to do it. I think because he was such a big TV star at the time. Oh yeah, I mean he turned down James Bond at that time. Yeah, speaking he of James, down Bond, James Bond, he turned it. Patrick McGowan is one of my favorite badasses. So, and he he really was a contentious prick. I yeah. think. Yeah. No one yells like Patrick McGowan. Oh no. <laughs> I will not be phoned. Yes. I am mutilated. not a number. Yeah, yeah. Like every episode of The Prisoner, it's like, what would you like for dinner, Gov? Who are you? Like he just instantly goes off and it's fantastic. I did it on my show a week ago and uh, only a couple people got it. I, I, and, I, and I did the opening of the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who are you? I, yes. I'm the new number two. Yes. You are number six. Who is number one? I am one? not a number. <laughs> who is number one? Yeah, who is number so, one? You're watching a lot of British stuff because there's a lot of American uh, British co-productions right. in the 60s. So you're the first thing I remember seeing you on was Whose Line Is It Anyway? Because yeah. you kind of went over to England and, and sort of made your name over there. Right. First thing is fair to say. What was it like when you first went over there comparing it to all these things that you watched as a kid? All this, it was mostly swing in 60s stuff. Like, even, we even got stuff like Adam Adamant over here and some of the of weirder stuff. And there was a really weird kids' show called The Double Deckers that ran for one year here that I think was more popular in England. It had a fat character named Donut, and they lived on a I remember the theme song and uh, come aboard with the double deckers. Fun and laughter is what they're after on a double, double, double decker bus yeah. with a bell, ding, ding, and a horn. Uh, uh. And I, I remember watching that and thinking, oh, England must be so cool. Yeah. And then you get there, of course, and the streets are full of garbage and there's railings everywhere. Yeah. And <laughs> it wasn't it's dark. It, it did live up to it because when I first went there in the late 80s, um, there are still red phone boxes, uh, which are kind of disappearing because of mobile phones. And, uh, People now don't need prostitutes anymore. Yeah, yeah. And right, in the, in <laughs> yeah. the red phone boxes were all the cards for prostitutes, yep. which were always called artist models. Yes. Right. And, uh, and then, like, uh, I would think it was Bill Bryson who said, going there the first time, the zebra crossings that say, look left. You really need because, to look left. Because, right, there's so many Americans who look the wrong way, and yeah. you almost get creamed by a bus oh, the first absolutely. day you're there. Yeah, I, I started comedy there as well. I, uh -huh. I went to school over there. and yeah, oh, did you? I, I, was, you I went to Goldsmiths oh, okay. uh, down in South London. Sure. And, uh, yeah, it was... It was I mean, my view of England was always a little more dystopian because I kind of right. came of age in this sort of punk rock. And uh, all the 70s kids shows from England, I watched like Children of the Stones oh, yeah. and the Tripods and all these really grim right. survivors and all this stuff like that. So I was like, oh, it's not as bad as I thought. But I could see if you were like 60s swing in England. Well, and I, like, I was a big fan of punk. So yeah. everywhere I go in London, and when I still do, if I'm in Hammersmith, I sing White Man in Hammersmith right. Palais. If I'm on the Waterloo Bridge, I sing Waterloo Sunset. Like every neighborhood in London has yeah. a song about it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And Ray Davis of the Stones or somebody wrote a song about yeah. every bloody neighborhood. I lived, in, neighborhood. I lived in Brixton for a while, right. and the there wasn't a day that didn't yeah. go by that Guns of Brixton was right. not coming out of my the mouth. Paul Simonon's yes. horrible singing. Yes. Uh, the guns, guns of Brixton. Brixton. Yeah. Like, you would have thought he would have been like, all right, that's a great guide track. Let's do another take. Right. <laughs> He's like, Why no. Why are you mixing this one? No, I'm fine. Uh, we yeah. got it. So one what thing. Yeah, she gets her kicks in uh they Thanks, kicked down your front anymore. door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you were growing up, so you're you're growing up in San Francisco area. It's ah. the height of sort of psychedelic hippiedom, and you don't strike me as that kind of person at <laughs> all. Like you're you're uh, sort of a punk rock guy uh, in attitude and in sort of outlook in life. I think in a lot of ways, based on you know what yeah. I heard you say. Uh, how how did that come about? Because that seems sort of a, 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 the antithesis of the area you grew up in. Well, the one thing that I did get from the 60s that I think has poisoned me forever, and, uh, and the Bay Area did the same thing to me because of the atmosphere, is um, the peace and love and nonviolence thing. I never understood when, when punk came out. Of course, I loved it and, and you know, went and saw The Clash and everybody and, uh, and had all the records and everything. And, and we would drive up to San Francisco to see shows. I never understood why punks hated hippies so much. There was always this, like, kill hippies element to it. And I always thought, yeah, hippies were, 
didn't weren't completely evolved. Right. But uh, I, I they're did, not bothering anyone. But well, I you know to be against war is not the worst thing in the world, and yeah. that's the one thing I think I absorbed from there. And that I when I got into the regular world and started seeing other parts of the country and other places, uh, didn't realize that there wasn't that ethos. Right. And it's a shock when you leave yeah. the area and all of a sudden you go places and people are fascists and have yeah. American flags everywhere and they care about guns. They're and, the riflemen. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. And there's Confederate flags and you go, oh, you really think this? Yeah. It was a culture shock for me to be in the world. And, and I think that's what I carry with me all the time is that, that information. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm desperate to disseminate that information all the time. And uh, I find that the world is still highly resistant to oh, it. Oh, no, I agree. And, you know, how did you, how did you come about a lot of that stuff? Like, I discovered a lot of that stuff, you know, growing up here in Boston, we were yeah. lucky enough to have some really good college radio and yeah. stuff. But there was a show called Night Flight on USA Network that showed, you know, uh, Another State of Mind and, and you know, Smithereens and all yep. these, these punk rock movies. And that's kind of how I encountered that stuff. Yeah. And how were you getting exposed to that stuff uh, at that time? Was it older kids? Were you hearing it? You know, oh, in the 60s? Yeah. yeah. Well, like I said, my sister was seven years older than me, so she was 16 when I was, what, nine? And so she brought home all those records and right. all that. And um, all the radio in the Bay Area, this is the, the, the transitional period between Top 40, and there right. were two big Top 40 stations, and they were really eclectic. You would hear yeah. soul music and white people music. There was no... It was an actual uh, was, top 40. Right. The, yeah. the, 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 uh, and novelty songs and yep. occasionally a weird instrumental. And every once in a while, like a bizarre reggae fluke or some yeah. kind of novelty shit would get in there that wasn't supposed to happen. Uh, and I memorized those. They used to, at the grocery store, there was a list of the top 40 every week. Really? And you were supposed to go, yeah, we would just go get it. And look, like I could, for some reason, I could tell you like almost every song in the top 40 from one week in 1972. I simply remember reading it all the right. time. I was like, Honky Cat by Elton John and, you know, uh, 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 City of New Orleans by Arlo Guthrie. And um, so I listened to those radios. And then at, at the transition in the late 60s, early 70s is when FM right. started to be really powerful. And the sig uh, people started to listen to it in their car. That was the big turning point right. when cars started to carry FM frequency. And then... We had a radio station in San Francisco called KSAN, and that was a really hip eclectic station. Okay. And it had uh, uh, enlightened management. Right. Tom, Don Tom uh, Donahue started it, and that station embraced punk before everyone else. Right. It was a free form. So, it, was, right. it would be like our WBCN was here right. in the 70s. And then, but, you know, then uh, now FM radio is basically classic rock and oh, schlocky, yeah. schlocky, If schlocky. it even exists. I right. Mean, one of the, it's, it's a little off topic uh, from television, but I also collect top 40 uh, broadcasts from, oh, really? from the 60s all the way through the, the 90s uh, from the UK and the US. And it's always interesting to me to, you know, play a 1982 UK top 40 versus a 1982 US top 40 because the UK is pure. It's yeah. actual sales. Yeah. So you'll have the band Discharge right after a disco song. And here, it's clearly what the, what the labels sent them. Mm -hmm. you know? and, it, it, and that was a real revelation to me. The English Top 40 is really wild. And, yeah. and when you watch those old Top of the Pops, you won't know half the acts. Oh, yeah. You'll go like, who's Caesar and Cleo? How'd yeah. they get in there? Who, who's Boney M? Oh, you yeah. Know? And you have bands like the Toy Dolls have right, a hit right, signal. Right, right. A hit the single. Fabulous Poodles. Yeah, that's right. Really, really bizarre, <laughs> yeah. and that was a huge revelation to me. And that was sort of opened my worldview when I would see that kind of stuff. You know, back to where you're talking about when you travel in the U.S. and you yeah. realize the, every, you know, I had the same experience. And I remember there was a there's a movie called The Intruder uh, mm -hmm. that Roger Corman directed, which I, you may or may not have seen. It's it's yeah. uh, Will Shat uh, Will uh, Will Shatner. Uh, William Shatner, and it's the uh, Roger Corman quotes it as the only movie ever made that lost money. Oh, really? And it's a drama, it's straight drama, and it's about a, a white racist from the north who comes down south to like stir shit up, yeah. basically. And it's Shatner, and he's charming, and it's really gray area, and it's a really good movie. Wow. And it was written by um, a guy who wrote all the Twilight Zones that isn't Richard Matheson. I was going to say Richard Matheson. Yeah, and uh, isn't um, Earl Hamner. Yeah, it's Char Charles uh, Charles Beaumont. Yeah, probably. Is. Um, and so I remember seeing that, and that was kind of my first exposure of like the South. And right. I was looking at it like a Twilight Zone episode. Yeah. And I'm like, this is clearly sort of science fiction. And then when I was in my band, we went down South, and I'm like, mm -hmm. This is pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. This is terrifyingly accurate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's interesting to see like what you're exposed to on television, you know, how it all is on the same 
plateau. It's, you know, you're watching The Avengers, which is pure fantasy. Mm -hmm. And then you're watching a movie that's actually pretty realistic, but I would at, you know, eight, nine, 10, pure fantasy. Mm -hmm. And sort of reconciling those things is, is sort of terrifying. It's isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. And then when you get set out to see the reality of it, you're like, oh, the media distorts everything. And that's a big, that's a thing that I think is hilarious in this day and age when there's so much information and we're bombarded with it and right. everybody carries, uh, Something we dreamed about when I was oh, little, yeah. which is a little device that you can... It's call. a tricorder. Yeah, you can, <laughs> yeah. You can check things on it. You yeah. can go find out anything in the world instantly. Uh, and yet people don't use that. And people still believe what the media puts yeah. out. Yeah. People are completely gullible. Uh, culpable. They repeat crappy memes that they've been told. Yep. They, 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 the misinformation oh. is just staggering. Memes bother me. So I, I, this is a soapbox that I'm on all the time. But people who can't have sort of in jokes on their own volition. Yeah. So they're just like, fail. Yeah. Oh, that right, kind of stuff. It's like, right. sorry online, I'm gonna I'm like, no, just come up with your own stuff. Like have an interaction yeah. with a human being. And it's in a lot of ways it's so much easier to interact with everybody in the world. As you said, you have the sum total of human knowledge mm -hmm. and media in your pocket. And but you need to know what to look for. And I think when you know when we were growing up and you're watching these things and and you saw a movie late night or a really weird show that was only on, you know, mm -hmm. a British show that was only on for right. one season, you you're like, did I dream that? And then when you find a person who'd also seen it yeah. you're like you're my friend yeah. <laughs> we have this right, in common right, now right. and that was not the case uh for the last 10 years and in, in, in the future maybe not no uh it isn't uh, things are you had to find things that would be the the biggest difference between punk rock and now i don't decry now and I, I would never say the old days were better or anything like that and i the 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 element of having smartphones on the internet to me is what we're able to do right now yeah the wild independence of that is very punk to me and, and, and fits in with my viewpoint of the world, which is that everybody should do what they need to do. The difference was, I think, you reminded me of something when you said the sum total knowledge of the universe. There was a, the Outer Limits and the Twilight yes. Zone. Yeah. And the Outer Limits and the Twilight Zone had serious moral. Oh, absolutely. And the moral was always humanity. Yeah. Don't They're be such humanist fascist. shows. Yeah, and don't be greedy and yeah. don't be a horrible monster uh, that that we're monsters yeah. was the theme of both shows, and that we have to quell those instincts and try to play higher. They're the most atheist shows I can uh, imagine. Isn't that wild? Yeah. And like that was where I got all my information about morality. Me too, absolutely. You know, and you think that's gone from TV because the, the, one, there's no anthology shows anymore. No, but two, the, 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 there's no imperative to do anything moral. Bad people are main characters in shows now so much more, and you see them as anti-heroes and rewarded right. for being sociopaths. Right. You know, you get stuff like uh, The Sopranos and Mad Men and, and that yeah. sort of stuff, which are quality shows, yeah. but the good lead writing, character is a horrible person with, like, no moral mm -hmm. compass. Who deserves and, to be whacked. Exactly. <laughs> Even in comedies like Curvy Enthusiasm yeah. or these sort of things. So you don't get, yeah, these moral plays anymore. Yeah. And it did it in a way that wasn't Davy and Goliath. It wasn't yeah, heavy-handed religious, you know? That, that was hilariously uh, uh, overt. And w the Christianity. Oh, it would be like, this is great, this is great. And then all of a sudden you'd be like, God is like that. Where is this yeah, coming yeah, from yeah, all yeah, of a sudden? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I got the lesson. I didn't need the God right. in there. And I love that it was Davy and Goliath yeah. and the, the dogless Goliath. Which doesn't make any sense. At all, because yeah. Goliath is the emblem of evil. It's the villain. Yeah, it, is. it made no sense. They're just like they flipped through a Bible and were like, yeah, it's two good names. Yeah. Uh, that, that was like, the, that was a... It was a Sunday morning boring when there was like Saturday morning was awesome because yeah. all the banana splits was on yep. and the Archies and uh, 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 all my favorite cartoon shows and live action one like the banana splits was a complete yeah. freak out. And the based most off bizarre the monkeys thing. and yeah. hard days and night like what if they wore costumes? I loved the banana splits and then uh, then like Sunday morning there'd be nothing. No, you'd have church. Yeah. Maybe on a lot of stations. <laughs> and then bloody Davy and Goliath. Yeah, Davy and Goliath, which <laughs> Excuse me. was sort of mesmerizing it and was. how weird. Cause and it stop, so slow. It was so slow. And stop motion instantly as a kid, I was like, yeah. this is sort of uncanny because yeah. it's not animated, but it but it's not real. Right. And it was totally weirded me out and I couldn't not watch it. Well, the, usually the only things that were stop motion were like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Yeah. All the Rankin, Rankin Bass. Bass. Yeah. yeah, until Rankin Bass... Uh, decided that was not worth the money and started doing those awful animated yeah. to, like the uh, like mad monster party right which is maybe my favorite rankin bass thing but it's probably the worst script they have yeah. it's just like shut the sound off and just look at it yeah. it's, and also the female lead really hot yeah for, that's a, true. for an animated puppet. i was gonna say well the episode i was thinking of of the outer limits was i can't remember the name of it or anything they land on a planet 
Uh, it's an American crew, of course. Yeah. And uh, they find these creatures who look like anemones, and they live in an aquarium, and they can speak. Yep. And they they possess the sum total knowledge of the universe. Right. And another race is coming to get them as part of like a vendetta payoff. They have to be destroyed. Yeah. And they realize this because they're higher beings. They than have us. the sum total. Uh huh. And so the ship captain goes, "Oh my God, do we save you?" And they're like, "No." You can't save us because yeah. this other race demands our demise. But in the meantime, we're happy to give you all the information, but we won't be able to even give you but a parcel of it yeah. before they come and get us. And that was the moral dilemma of that show. And you think, hmm, that's not a question that gets asked no, anymore. Now that, that, that we have the sum total in our hands in a phone, people never look it up. They spend all their time looking at, at their friends and yeah, Instagramming and being douches. Look at these tits. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. It's, 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 it's so weird. Like, that would be like in that episode if these higher beings said, we can give you the sum total knowledge, and the guy was like, you don't have a lot of time. Can you just uh, show me all the tits? Right. I, want I just want to cat. see all the tits yeah. and maybe cats. If yeah. you could do that, I'm perfectly happy. Like, that moral question or that more philosophical question mm. raised in that episode, that's an entire college course. Mm -hmm. And it's on a network television show yeah, that you're kids. eating your TV dinner right, watching. Right, right, right. And your and mom and dad are watching with you. Insane. Yeah. Insane. Well, they played at a high level. Absolutely. I mean, that's what, I mean, like TV writing, like you say, is very good now. There's, you know, Breaking Bad and all those shows. They, they certainly do present. Right. Uh, Morality, but in a very different way. There was a, I don't know, maybe it was the post World War II writers that that were going for that. Maybe Richard Matheson and Beaumont and Earl Hamner and all the well Harlan Ellison, who I wouldn't yeah. say is the most moral person in the world. Demon but, with a glass hand. Right, and that soldier, episode's amazing. Which are Terminator? Yeah, he which won he that sued case. successfully yeah. because it is. Yeah, I mean, I. I love that episode. I love that episode it's so great. Goes over to the cat. What are your orders? Yes, it's great. It's. <laughs> The thing that I always think is that we, the people sort of who are making television and, and music and, and media and things, you know, sort of pre-1970, all had a life before they got into mm, creating these mm, things. Mm. Whether it be, you know, they worked in radio or they worked in vaudeville, comedy, drama, all these things. Or they were authors, worked in pulps. Right. And I think because of that, it brought sort of a... Um, a naivety to creating things where they were saying, I'm just making this. I'm not making it for television. I'm mm -hmm. not making it for an intended audience. And after that, we had a generation who grew up watching those things and it, they're sort of tainted by it for better or worse. But mm. now they're making things with an audience in mind. They understand the mechanics of television. And weirdly, as a result, you get less interesting things. I know. Right. And especially network TV where they just don't want to, Every once in a while, something gets through that has some creativity, but almost all of it's been relegated to cable and pay cable. Yeah, and that's because... And then now Netflix and Amazon and da-da-da. Which is almost out of desperation, yep. because they're going, look, we just... You know, it's a, it's a pay cable station. They go, we just want something, and uh, hey, we're not going to watch you because we don't understand anything. Right. <laughs> Do what you want. And then once they go, oh, this formula works, we're going to get involved, the money people, it's awful. Right, And right. I am kind of excited now that we're... The current times remind me of like the mid 80s mm. where we still had movie theaters where people would go see movies yes. and not just spectacle. Uh, we had you had drive ins and all these things still. Yeah. You had cable and local television still because the Telecommunications Act hadn't wiped out local television. Right. And so you were just getting all this content generated yeah. because all these stations needed content and they almost didn't care what it was. No, no, no. They fill out the schedule. Yeah. And, stuff. and so just by volume, you'd get some interesting stuff. Mm. And now with the arms race between the, the web people who just want to, they'll lose money. They just want to get established. We're getting interesting stuff again. I agree. I think you're right. The mid eighties were a wild time and the demise of local television is a terrible thing. There was lots of weird local yeah. shows yeah. and they, they've just gone by the wayside. Did now what's left news. They don't even Pretty do much. kids shows anymore. But even the news, I worked at a local news station here and it was, it was shocking to me to learn that basically they just have a consultant come in mm -hmm. who, who just sells them how everything should look and sound. So channel seven in Boston looks and sounds exactly like channel seven in Florida, sure. same voiceover guy. And a lot of the news packages are just PR pieces that are sent to them by mm -hmm. companies who make the things that they're doing a report about. And they're happy to play them. Exactly. And they're just big commercials. Yeah. The other thing that's sad is like, I go in to do all these morning TV shows all over the country right. and there's no cameraman anymore. No, it's all robots. Um, New York City and uh, no, Chicago doesn't have them anymore. But New York City might be the last place where when you go on the floor, uh, there's camera people. Right. And that's probably because of unions. Yep. And <laughs> yeah. then maybe in LA one or two places, but... Um, 
it's all robots. Yeah. Uh, and then, like, I was in New Zealand a couple years ago, and I did their breakfast TV and all their talk shows. Not a cameraman to be found. Right. So that job has disappeared. Which is like an outer person. limits. <laughs> yeah, it is, right? Because yeah. these robot cameras just come swinging around yeah. you and everything. And it's like, uh, but what about the human element? Right. Uh, and like you say, local news takes buys corporate packages. Yeah. And literally to promote products and stupid things like that. Yeah. Like Botox injections. Right. And, yeah. It's and crazy. so where's the reporting? Where's the... And that, well, that's the other big uh, uh, point, I, I, th- I think, like you were saying about the mid-'80s. Um, the page six of this TV guide we picked here is about TV newsmen behind the Viet Cong lines. Yeah. Not embedded newsmen. No. Not uh, news people who were forced to go with the government and only show government footage. But the reason why the Vietnam War came to the crashing halt that it did was it was shown every night of my childhood. It, uh, the nine, eight, nine years that it lasted... Um, at dinner, yeah. you would see combat footage. The horrors of mm-hmm. it. And a guy standing in a flak jacket yeah. with a bunch of people shooting behind him. Yeah. And they would go, this village got wiped out. And then when um, Seymour Hersh did the uh, uh, expose on My Lai, which I think started in like the St. Louis Dispatch and then worked its way up to the New York Times and then became a giant story, that whole thing played out over my childhood of... It, what is war? Yeah. Because so we went into this village and uh, Captain Medina ordered Lieutenant Kelly to burn the fucker to the ground right. and kill every man, woman, and child. Sometimes there's no good guy. Right? <laughs> yeah. And then so that, but then the public had to deal with that. Yeah. Uh, whereas with Abu Garb and Guantanamo and then this, the torture report that came out, we're not getting the same moral imperative from the media. No. Well, I think because... Dick Cheney came on and said he'd do it again in a minute. Yeah, and there were people who cheered him on. Right, and not, also, not remorse over it and going, no, these are atrocities. Don't you see we're as bad as the monsters were? I'm sure this has been covered before, but that man literally has no heart. He literally has no heart. Yeah. He is a cyborg with a cybernetic heart machine yeah. that doesn't even beat. Yeah. <laughs> like that's. And the last heart he got from a person, they asked him, do you ever think about the person you got the heart from? And he went, no. No. I never give it any thought. That, that is the most sci-fi thing I can think of. Like The most evil man in the last 20 years is a literal monster machine. Yep. Like That's insane. Yep. The architect of our uh, the global economy collapse, the architect of all the war, the endless war that it's we're in It's crazy. Now. I mean, I think one of the things that's changed as well is with the sort of narrow casting and all the choices we have, uh, you know, and smarter people than me have covered this, you don't have to look at news that doesn't already reinforce your worldview. Right. You're, you're not you're being questioned. cherry picking so that, uh, and liberals are as guilty of it as, oh, absolutely. as everyone's guilty of it. Yeah. Uh, you, you go to a site that you disagree with and you're like, Oh, I don't want that. Let me find one I agree with. Right, and then all of a sudden (laughs) you find one that panders to what you like. Yeah. Um, On my podcast, I'm always telling people to never believe anything they hear. You should. And then they go, but what about you? And I'm like, me either. Yeah. Excuse me. I say, I have a giant agenda. Yeah. But I'm I'm free in telling you that I have an agenda. Right. And uh, that I try to tell the truth as I see it. But when you, I go, you read a newspaper, you watch TV, you're on the internet, whatever it is, remember Remember that question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't don't accept blindly the things you bloody hear because they're right. lies. And you know, not to say that you know, in the sixties and fifties on television, what didn't have an agenda because it oh, certainly no, did. It's not unvarnished truth. No, ever. it no, no, certainly no. did. Even the news and you know, and Twilight Zone and, and Outer Limits, they were a very liberal mm-hmm. bias. You know, very uh, you know against the sort of communist hunts right. and all these things. But they were at least doing it in a way. And I, talking this out now, I can't tell if this is better or worse. That was coded, so it was, it was allegorical and, yeah. and not and straight up. You know, it was morality plays, right? So you could watch that with with by missing the the greater mm-hmm. comment. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, the, the other thing about you know the glory days of TV and all that is, um, news was reported by white men. Yes, and there were three networks. Yeah, and that was it, baby. So. Yep. Talk about a lack of diversity in the viewpoint. Yeah. Uh, and um, when I was little, all the World War II guys were still on TV. Oh, yeah. It was Walter Cronkite and um, uh, uh, David Brinkley. Yep. And uh, Eric Severide and all the cats who'd worked with Murrow yep. uh, during the war. And that whole clique. Uh, so they were middle-aged guys by then. Yeah. Uh, and they carried that with them. So now the diversity of TV, on the one hand, there's a million more channels. Uh, and now there's actual women and black people and minorities right. allowed to report the news. Well, you got to look for it. But right, but <laughs> yeah. the, but the the the, the investigative journalism is completely 
uh, up to the reporter. No yeah. giant news gathering group has any agenda other than to stay alive as an entertainment entity. Right, and to keep getting paid. Right, so Matt Taibbi yeah. or, 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 or Amy Goodman or the reporters that are Greg Palast that are really digging um, are in danger. Yeah. They're in, they're in physical danger, like the cat who died last year in, La, in Los Angeles whose yes. car blew up at four in the morning. Yeah, he mysteriously. Was, he blew up that whole story about the Pentagon, and yeah. you're like... Uh, I always say to my wife that the line in The Godfather is the truest line of, uh, uh, what does he say? Uh, if, if history's taught us one thing, Kay, it's that anyone can be murdered. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And especially world leaders, and especially... Uh, people think they're immune to it, but... Um, there's bad forces all the time, yeah. and uh, people get disappeared constantly for the bad for the things they say that are seem that appear to contradict the government. Or absolutely, I mean, you know, what and was his name? The professor who uh, was the uh, who was the arms. Um, I'm blanking on his name. He was English, and he went to Iraq, and he discovered that there were no WMDs yes, whatsoever. Yes. And he was found to have committed suicide. Yeah, well, clearly. By was... cutting one wrist open yeah. in, right before the war began. And Tony Blair, like, oh, well, he was depressed. That's what happens. Mm -hmm. But it's so... I think because we have all this knowledge and with the sort of mainstream nature of conspiracy theories and how people love these conspiracy theories and it's entertainment now, it makes the real stuff that we should be going, you know, the government clearly killed that person. People go, oh, that's conspiracy theory. I'm like, no, this is different than chemtrails and right, alien right, blizzards. Right, right. Right. But they, they lump it all in together. Yeah, they do. And it discredits everything. The confusion. And also the democracy of the internet it doesn't, uh, offer clarity. No. And, and you have not just like David Icke. Yeah, yeah, you know what right, I mean? Like right. the, that man is a was a former footballer with a head injury. Yeah. Like he has he has a traumatic brain injury. Yeah. He's not a person who's like, no, I think we found radiation from the Russian government on this guy and he was poisoned. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, David Icke. Like, no, no, no. <laughs> They're totally different things. Right. And you know, Matt Drudge and people like that yeah. who just totally have a their and there's uh, hate in their hearts. And oh, they absolutely. Wanna, they're working it out on everybody. And they're, they're all G. Gordon Liddy. Mm -hmm. They're right, all right, G. Gordon right. Good Liddy. Good Romans. Yeah. yeah. The other thing is, too, that I, that I find odd is that what passes for investigative journalism now is essentially prank shows. Uh -huh. They're like candid camera. Right. Like, I'm going to catch like, you out. Yeah. Like Alan Funt would have been like, he's like, no, I'm an investigative journalist. Like, no, you're doing a hidden camera prank show. Same right. thing. It's yeah. like, it's not the same thing. No. <laughs> like that guy who went to, to the Muslim bakery trying to get him to make a gay cake or yeah. you know whatever. It's like, this is a prank show. This is not journalism. Right. Right. There, there, there's, a, there's a lack of gravity and no one knows uh, I don't know if we've lost it. I, I hate. To, I don't want to sound like an old person and say that there was values before and now there's not because right. I think that's nonsense. Yeah. But there's uh, there was a nod toward gravity and dignity, yes. and we've lost that. Uh, we don't dignify anything or anyone anymore like no. we used to. No. We used to have figures that you would go, well, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and right. let them be important. And now with the internet and the way that everything's there's. They want to divide the world into black and white, and that's the right. other thing I'm always harping on. There is no black and white. You can't. Every issue is wildly complex. Yeah. But, like, you know, people go, oh, like, for just this is just for instance, not something that. Obama is a socialist. Obama right. uh, is a Muslim. Obama Secret Muslim? A, a born in a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this gets repeated again and again and again, and all of it's nonsense. Yeah. He, he, he's the least socialist president in the history of mankind. Yeah. We've sold more arms than we did under Bush. Um, uh, healthcare is not socialism. Yeah. I mean, and then, the, oh, he's a Muslim. And like, no, he's not. Well, he might have even attended a madras or whatever, but who right. cares? It's when did you stop beating your wife? Right. It's That's exactly right, what it right, is. Which right. People don't know that's a famous question, like a gotcha question. I, I forget yeah. who asked it, but it's like, I never did. But now people just remember, uh -huh. he got asked when he stopped beating his wife. So he must have been. Oh, well, I was reading it yeah. today about Hillary because, you know, she's going to throw her hat in tomorrow. Right. And, uh, uh, which I love that expression. I don't know where the fuck that came from. Yeah. Uh, and Do you ever imagine going to a, going to a boxing match and some guy in the audience throws his hat in the ring and it's like, he's going to fight him next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, right. we have to do what he threw his hat in. I guess I'll raise a white flag. Yeah. Uh, here's my towel. Let me throw that in and end this. Uh, she, and, and it said, uh, remember when you read about her and, and uh, all the memes that, uh, that keep getting repeated, uh, 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 secretive. Yes. And then, secretive, secretive, secretive. She was secretive about her email. She was secretive about Benghazi. She was secretive about that as well. She wasn't. She testified in front of Congress. And yes. She did a lot of things that aren't secretive. Greg, but did she? Yeah, right. <laughs> right? And then the, the guy says, 
The point is, if you repeat it enough, the word gets attached to you. Yeah. And then, oh, she was fiercely defiant over yes. this and things. Defiant, defiant, defiant. I was like, well, first of all, if a man played it the way she plays it, um, they would just be being a man. Which Heroic is patriot. Canny, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, holding your cards yeah. to the chest. Uh, uh, don't fucking tell me what to do. Yeah. I won't be bothered. Rand so- Paul showing those uh, reporters oh. where to stick it. It's oh that kind God, of thing. He shushed Savannah Guthrie the other yeah. day. Uh, like, talk about being uh, out of temper with what's going on in the world. Like, yeah. I understand the grandstand he's playing to. Yeah. It's the don't put your cuffs on me, PC police. I'll yeah. do what I like. But... She wasn't asking a bold question. This is yeah. a morning breakfast TV show. Yeah. This isn't journalism time. You're running for president. And you're gonna get, <laughs> someone said uh, the other day, you're going to get asked a million stupider questions than this and yeah. a million more pointed questions. And if you're going to lose your temper the first time out of the box, he went shush to yeah. her on television. And yeah. it was like, um, do you perceive how women and sensitive human beings perceive you shushing a woman in the morning? No, that's the he that's do- the problem. Mm-hmm. He doesn't. <laughs> no, and his crowd wants him to do that. Yeah, they are tired of being bossed around by feminazis and blah blah well, blah blah. T- two interesting things that this reminds me of is that one, you know, back to Vietnam. That was the first television war. And right. before that, when you saw footage from World War II, it was newsreels, and mm. it was Saturday afternoon matinees, and you would right, see, right, right. you know, radar men from the moon, and then see a World War II report, and yeah. it was sort of, you put them, you know... The allies marching to Belgium. Exactly. It was Canadian on the same thing. Yeah. It was like, it's a cliffhanger. Everyone's fine. Yeah. But now you're seeing the true horrors. And punk rock, sort of, uh, you know, again, back to a while ago, or say, this, to me, I was in a punk rock band for mm-hmm. years, and I feel like this is the most DIY punk rock thing I've ever done, though. I mean, I'm recording this myself, I'm releasing it myself, mm-hmm. it's exactly what I want. And punk rock, to me, also was about questioning uh, authority Always. in a nihilistic way yeah. many times, but now I feel like we've gone way too far where we question everything, and nothing has gravitas, and mm. nothing has truth, and there is no final word anymore. Right. And that's terrible. <laughs> that's terrible in a lot of ways. It's gone far too far in the other direction. And we also have somehow rebranded the conservative world as the party party. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're, they're the deltas. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And it, it's like, when did this happen? They're like, hey, you guys are mellowing my buzz, man. Yeah. We're just trying to have a good time with right. some ladies and some beers. Right. And it's like, no, no, why? You're, that's, why, huh? And it's yeah. come full circle. And we want the right to discriminate. And we yeah. want it legally shown that That's a good our, time, man. Yeah, yeah. You're the PC police. And that's why you can't, you can't have conservative comedy to me I agree uh, people ask me about that and they, they go do you have a responsibility to show both sides and I say no yeah. I don't have any responsibility because there aren't two sides there's a million sides comedy is about questioning things yeah. to me um, George it, Carlin said it the exactly I, the world is a circus and I'm here to stand on the side and watch it yeah I'm not there to get in the middle of it and tell you what's right and what, I, I'm here to say tell you everything's fucked right. up right and even a show like Laughing you know, on at this I time, which was made by the man. Yeah. Like that was old men at a network trying yeah. to make a youth yeah. show. Yeah. And just because I think inherently because it was comedy and the times despite itself is a questioning show. In a yeah, lot it of is. Ways, it is. Which is weird. It was really liberal. And I think, I think uh, Dan Rowan had a lot to do with the viewpoint. Like they would do the, the news of the future on the right. show and Reagan would be president and things yeah. like that, which was unheard of in the late sixties, which is a science fiction, dystopian science fiction right? future. And he would do general bull, right? And he'd come out in full uniform with all the duck and his, he made his children act like they were in the army and right. that he was clearly a hawk. And, uh, and then Dan Rowan started wearing a peace sign. Yeah. Every week during the show, which was real seditious in those days, yeah. because you weren't supposed to question the war. No, just like now, and uh, and then of course the Smothers Brothers show, which yes. was wildly that's Dicky. I mean, yeah, that show didn't actually even have to go off the air. They always talk about CBS pulled it and right. it's like that. Dick simply wouldn't do what they wanted him right. to he do. He wouldn't play so ball. He pulled it off, and yeah. in essence, in a corporate speak way. He couldn't deal with them anymore, yeah. and them getting mad at him every goddamn week for saying the war was killing people, right. and, having Seeger was. and having the Pete Seeger on doing big money, yeah. seeing big money, and and you you have a, a someone who was blacklisted and avowed a friend of communists, a, right. a, 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 an absolute civil rights champion. You put him on TV and let him sing an anti and a, a coached anti-war song, right? Like you say, a coded anti-war song, yeah. 
It's not even a song about Vietnam. It's a right. song about an officer asking people to kill themselves, right. basically. And, yeah. Uh, um, well, you know, getting back to your point about how there's no true, uh, uh, how um, we were talking about the news. You know, the the TV news in the seventies uh, and sixties wasn't trying to give you the truth all the time. No, because it took years to learn one that Vietnam was a complete fabrication. Yeah, and then later that. The CIA was using it as a ground base to deal drugs and arms right. through the Golden Triangle. Uh, and all this had to be gradually uncovered. It certainly wasn't something the networks were desperate to tell no. us. Uh, and Watergate was a complete accident that even yes. got uncovered. Uh, and then that became a shitstorm. And now, of course, like you say in conservative world, they've circled the wagons. And they've tried to rewrite everything. Yeah. They've, they've written Nixon out almost entirely. Yes. Uh, even though Nixon did a lot me? of... Nixon did a couple of hilarious. Uh, well, he started the Environmental Protection Agency, which they seem bound and determined to destroy. But uh, uh, someone put it very well once: Nixon, when he went to China and Russia, did something that he would have never allowed anyone else to do. And by doing it, he opened it up and it changed the face of everything. But if another president had said, "I'm going to go to China and talk to Mao," he would have gone, "You commie lover! Didn't he? How dare you do that?" But didn't he, he introduce had the Pepsi. Yeah. Isn't that one of the things he did? Pepsi he brought to Russia. Pepsi to Russia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And weird. Famously, one of the generals, not Zukov, but another famous Russian general during World War II, had a, a wild addiction to Coca-Cola, which he started drinking during the war. Yeah. And Coca-Cola would send him crates of it in unmarked bottles. They yeah. did different bottles for him so that they didn't know he was drinking it when he was in the you yeah. know, post-war Stalin administration. Coca-Cola was supposed to have been the the biggest disseminator of democracy during the war, right? Yeah. Because everywhere the troops went... They brought They coke? made sure they had Coca-Cola. The planes had Coke dispensing yes. taps in yes, them. Yes. That sounds insane, and people never believe no, me when I tell no. them this, but there were basically Coke kegs yeah. in World War II fighter planes, yeah. and they hooked all the GIs on it. They came back, and they went, love it. Right. It's a taste of home. It's the first uh, drink that you know is not alcohol that... Uh, that had caffeine in it right. that children were encouraged to take. Yes. This is at the, it came out during the patent medicine era, and when the patent medicine got taken away and they yeah. started to not let you drink opium yeah. uh, over the counter. Uh, it's fascist. Caffeine, you know, and yes, it had an element of cocaine in it at the beginning. And, and it still just. does to a degree. It's actually, right. yeah. But they, they, they started to market it to children, and yeah. that, was the, that was the big turning point, like when soda pop became yeah. a giant entity in the world. It hadn't, there's always been like sarsaparilla and root yeah. beer and jazz like that. Again, but local bottling plants. Right. Not it was like all local. Yeah, yeah, you had yeah. local TV. You had local bottling plants for beer and soda. And they all got bought up yeah. by corporations and just whitewashed and oh, made yeah. everything and, the and same. Coca-Cola went all the way to... Basically, they didn't even want Pepsi to exist. Right, and, right. And uh, Pepsi snuck up on them and kind of... So Nixon did a good thing. I've always been a Pepsi <laughs> guy. <laughs> Pepsi based in New York, Coke based in Atlanta. You know, I got to do the North-South. The war divide. really made that, though. I mean, I remember asking my dad was in the Coast Guard during World War II, and I asked him, did you ever uh, meet anyone who didn't smoke during the war? And he went, no. Yeah. Everyone smoked during World War II. He said, they gave us cartons of cigarettes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because they wanted us, you know, to pass the time. Of course, now we know that blah, blah, blah. But, uh, and it's very funny to me because having performed in military bases overseas and stuff, there's smoking areas. And you think, um, we're over here to kill people. Yeah. But don't do it slowly. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> What's interesting to me, I don't and know. And they don't let them buy porn at the BX either. No. They can well, buy that would Maxim be immoral. Magazine and, uh, uh, you know, those kind of men's. Yeah. The men's mm -hmm. ones that have bathing suits. And Which stuff. are so much sleazier than Playboy. Like, Playboy Magazine has, this is a cliche, yeah. but it really does have de decent articles in it. Yeah. And Maxim. But there's journalism. Yeah, it's like, okay, there's no nipples, but this is the sleaziest thing I've ever right, read in right, my right. life. It, but there's no nipples, so it's fine. But it's like, for, it's like Creepy Guy Magazine. Yeah. And I always thought that was funny. You go to the BX and. No porn at all. Yeah. You're not allowed to have that. But you can, of course, wipe people out. and or you can see the most gruesome thing you ever want. Mm -hmm. As long as you're not jerking off to it. Yeah. That's fine. Or actually, that's probably okay. <laughs> Let me see a human heart. Done. Yeah. But I don't know if you were watching a lot of TV in the 80s. You know, you, you started... I did up till a certain point, And then I was mostly... Between, like, you know... My teen years and my into my twenties, I was out every night. Yeah, I don't think I stayed home very much. Yeah. Well, I remember some eighty shows, but I never watched um, Michael J. Fox Family Ties. Michael yeah. J. Fox. I never yeah. watched that one, and I never watched uh, 
the facts of life. Or, yeah, but that was way outside your age. Target, yeah, yeah. I think at that point. Uh, what's the one with them? Um, Dave Coulier and uh, Full House. Yeah, yeah. Like I know all about it. Yeah, very San Francisco. Probably oh, yeah, the best sure. representation of San Francisco <laughs> on film <laughs> and highly accurate. Yes, uh, but I never. I I was just out all the time. But one of the interesting things about sort of the revival of these '60s shows in the '80s, you had the new Twilight Zone. Mm-hmm. There was a new Outer Limits. Was the the anti-Vietnam War stance. And so many shows had Vietnam vets who were fucked up yeah. as characters. Right, right. And you got things like, although not television, Jacob's Ladder. Yeah. And you got things that questioned this stuff. And it was only 10 years, 15 years after the yeah. war started. And we're 10 years, close to 15 years after Iraq, Afghanistan mm-hmm. started. Mm-hmm. We're not really seeing those things. We're not seeing these no. damaged people come back art. We're seeing it in, in news stories, yeah. if you look for them, yeah. but we're not seeing, I mean, there was, a, there was a new Twilight Zone episode that I remember just chilled me as a kid, and it was Bruce Dern, and he keeps seeing this ghostly figure of a guy in a wheelchair haunting him, and he's a draft dodger. And it turns out that that's an alternate universe version of himself who went to the war uh-huh. and is in a wheelchair now. And it's come back to And it's come back yeah. to... So it was like this thing where I was like, oh, the, you know, it inherently made me question these things as mm-hmm. a kid. And it makes me wonder how anyone that grew up watching this stuff could be conservative now. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're getting these sorts of things as a kid. Yeah. I feel like I was almost, for better or worse, sort of programmed against this stuff to question these things just based on the media I was getting. Right, no question. Well, I think it's... I, I, you know, uh, there's that there's that thing is is conservatism like something in your brain? It it, it seems to largely be based on fear and, yes. and mistrust. And yeah. So and and then the comfort of that fear and the comfort of that hate. Yeah. Uh, re, you know, like Orwell said, you, 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 if you destroy love and the bond between people, then you have to fill it with something. Right. And what you fill it with is fury toward an unseen endless enemy right and that the purpose of war is to diminish all the resources so that no one has anything good right and that the ruling class can just carry on being ruling and now we've seen everything he say said he knew it uh, because it was the truth then but it remains the truth and it's even more amplified now and i think in the last couple of years um especially since occupy uh a lot of people really that surprised me were so vehemently against it and like, oh, they're just scruffy right. trust fund hippies and da 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 and oh my god, they're shitting on the lawn and all that. Like that's a worse crime than ruining the economy of the world with chicanery and we don't have to clean that up, right? <laughs> I, I often, one of my jokes was uh, maybe if one of the heads of AIG or Sherson Lehman had shit in a park, yeah. then we could have arrested them, yeah, because lots of people from Occupy are still going through the legal process and nobody from the Wall Street scandal to my knowledge, has been incarcerated, had cuffs put on them. They have nice the, suits. Uh-huh. Nice suits. And, uh, but it raised the issue. And so I think it did a, a, a world of good for everybody because now the difference for me is uh, I, I'll go on, uh, P, I, I go on TV shows to plug my stuff or radio shows, right. which are largely irrelevant now. Yeah. Except the, for Good Day LA, which is hilarious. I love Good Day LA. <laughs> I love how much of a fucking wreck that show is. Good Day LA is amazing. It Every really time I go is. out, I have to watch it. I love it. it's the old guy and the two hot girls, And it's just right? crazy. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. like, I get up early, because I'm always on yeah. East Coast time, so I will get up early and just sit and watch that and be like, I love the Julian train Barbary. wreck. Bizarre. Yeah. They're, how is this on TV? Yeah, it's fantastic. Yes. And it, it's news in LA, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Well, Channel 13 in LA used to do the hilarious promo of Get your news on. <laughs> Get your news on. Yeah. And then, of course, it would be two girls dancing on a bar yeah. or whatever. And, like, we don't know what this is. And but like, in some ways, it's the most pure thing. that Because that's what everyone's doing. They're just like, we're just telling you exactly what we're right, doing. This is what's happening. Yeah. Nonsense. Sorry, well, I interrupted you. Well, that's okay. Shows, but yeah. My only point was uh, I, I go uh, on these shows. And whereas years ago, if you said something uh, like... The, well, here's the thing. I'll go on now, and they'll say to me, what's your bag or whatever, and I'll go, yeah. um, the rich are onto the poor. The rich are controlling everything. Yeah. The rich are dominating. There's no middle class. Your, right. They're we live and they live. Secret. There's, there's a giant disparity between what the people, and they're ruining all the cities by buying things up. Yeah. And now, on morning shows and news shows and radio shows, people go, mm-hmm. Whereas 10 years ago, five years ago, they wouldn't have. Yeah. They'd have contested me. Yeah. Now, it's just a given. Yep. And I think that it's partly because the internet, obviously the internet explodes a lot of things like the Church of Scientology, which yes. is heading for a wobbling fall here uh, before they go down flailing and fire off all their grenades, yep. um, is th- th- that the Occupy movement 
brought that into high relief, and then Romney, uh, the crappy Republican candidates of the last general election, uh, team rape and all that, yeah. the eight guys that weighed in with rape, all Binders of full of women. Yeah, and when Romney said binders full of women, uh, the 47%, and what was the other one? People think they're entitled to food, was yes. it? Yeah. Entitled to food. Yeah. When he said those things, and they were reported, and they and they were uh, gotcha, yeah. hidden camera Absolutely. things, um, it put it in high relief for everyone. Yeah. And so even if you're just wandering through life and you're the kind of person, which most people are, that go, I don't watch the news because yeah. I don't do anything. I'm it's so boring. Politics Check out this, don't, yeah. I don't know politics because it's, you know, it's confusing and, you know. It just makes people mad. Why don't they tell both sides, yeah. you know? Uh, a lot of people drift through life, but even those people have become aware. You had to be. There's a disparity between rich and poor and that uh, government offices are bought and sold yep. and that we're living in a... Uh, a paid plutocracy, yeah. uh, a, a kleptocracy, an oligarchy, whatever you want to call it, um, that there's no real democracy. Uh, and then at the same time that there's no real democracy, uh, because the government's such a fucked up, uh, uh, hideous, convoluted, disorganized, corrupt entity, we can run around it all the time. Yeah. We're still saying what we want to say, and we're not being arrested yet. Uh, which is what the net neutrality thing that went down yeah. I was raving about on my show. And I was like, f I said, for me, the worst part is not so much. Uh, uh, the worst part is that I don't want the government aware or the FCC aware of what we're talking about. Right. Because then comes the censorship. Right. Then comes the punitive fines. That's incitive. Then comes, yeah. yeah. Then comes pulling you off the air and going, we're not going to allow podcasts because we find them disruptive. Right. Uh, whereas now we still have the absolute freedom to say what the fuck we want. Absolutely. And I think that's the best part of it. Yeah. Uh, and that has to be protected. I was surprised uh, that, it, that it survived in its first form, This the first yeah. uh, go. I mean, in some ways, they're going to chip away at Oh, it. I'm sure they will. And in some ways, you know, if you wanted a, a voice, you needed to have, be a corporation because the, re the mm. resources that I have now at this table and the recording and right. the things we have, I would have had to work in a billion dollar studio yep. and now I can do that on my phone. Yep. You know, I have access, tech technological access, but it's good and bad because everybody does and there's so much out there. Right. It's, 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 it's a forest of trees. Yeah. And, and you have to somehow rise above it to have some kind of profile. Right. And then how much profile do you want to have? Right. And then as soon as you have a lot of profile... Like uh, you're a target. <laughs> well, one, you're, right. right? Like I, I read a terrible thing about marrying yesterday on some blog. You know, they wanted to take a pot shot at him, and at the same time, like you know, why shouldn't if you're working your whole career in entertainment to be as a comedian, why shouldn't you want to succeed? Well, why is that so. bad when everyone else is allowed to fucking grasp for everything they? Well, so we, I, uh, you're a sellout because yeah. you do a thing, and like you think mm. he should be a plumber. That's a weird right? thing for me. Like when people complain about celebrities having an opinion on something, yeah. I'm like, they're a human being that lives in the country. Mm -hmm. Like they would have an opinion. It's like, Just make your fucking movie, say your words. And it's like, no, how right. come uh, an athlete can say it or a guy who's an electrician or a plumber? But if you have a different oh, job, how I, about retired generals and all the crappy pundits that they drag out yeah. on TV who are paid by corporations to absolutely yeah. state party lines and restate talking points. Right. That's all they're paid to do. Whenever a war or anything comes on, the next thing you see is men. Yeah. Because it's a very small percentage of women and, and minorities. Sometimes Condoleezza Rice. Who's sometimes, both? Sometimes Condoleezza <laughs> Rice. Both a paid <laughs> corporate person and a black person. Yes. And highly educated yep. uh, to do those things. They come on and they bloviate. And they, they repeat the same thing over and over. Yeah. And then there's all these, you know... Uh, 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 what's his name? Crowdhammer. And, yeah. uh, you know, Fox has about 50 or 60 guys who simply are there to say the stupidest, most awful thing yeah. over and over and over again. Yeah. Uh, and they're not experts on anything. No, no one is an expert now, and everyone's an expert. It's a, like self-proclaimed experts. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you know, the, w w we signed a treaty with, or we're getting ready to sign a treaty with Iran. This should be hailed as a as a moment, a small victory in what has been a comprehensive shitstorm of nastiness in Central Asia. Iran Contra, right? <laughs> I mean, Reagan sold arms to the Iranians. I have not heard that come up once in all the discussion right. of people complaining about this. <laughs> like, what was remember? going on with Reagan was shocking, and how he won the election was by cabaling with the Iranians 
to make sure they didn't release the hostages before the election rolled around, and so Carter lost. Yeah. If Carter had been able to get the hostages out, there's every possibility he would have won that election. Right. And so, and and not to mention the fact of Iran Contra. And I've always bring it up on my show because no one ever talks about it because Reagan is somehow being rewritten into being this great leader. I remember at the time. Everyone complained about Reagan. Mm-hmm. Even conservative people mm-hmm. complained about Reagan. How many people left his administration under a cloud or were indicted? Somewhere between three or four hundred? Andy was a joke. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. you had spitting image yeah. to, in a Genesis video right. <laughs> making fun of Reagan. Right. He was riding a dinosaur. He was a joke. It was every Saturday Night Live. Yep. Uh, everything. He was a joke. And now he's like the second coming. Right. They're like, he was a terrible, you? ineffective president. He ignored the AIDS crisis. I, I blame him for the deaths of zillions of innocent people. Yeah. A war in Central America. Uh, the cocaine trade. Well, uh, breaking mean, the unions. He was an evil, evil, cruel person. Speaking of San Francisco and punk rock, and I mean, you had the dead Kennedys. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. was all, here's all the fucked up shit Reagan's doing. And, you know, that was sort of the thing. I don't see people questioning that stuff no, in the same no. way now. No, they, they say stupid things about Reagan. Yeah. And, like he was good. Yeah, that is because probably the dumbest thing you was, could say about Well, I mean, whereas I don't, I don't, like, you know, Nixon was as corrupt and venal as, as any president Absolutely. ever was. But he's sort of gotten dropped by the wayside a little yeah. bit. And, you know, when he died and Clinton gave him that glowing obituary. Oh, and very that, weird. Well, I mean, it's like one's, you know, they're all in a club together. Yeah. And they're just tipping the hat to the other guy. Like, yeah. well, he got caught for all that jazz. Right. But, Let's look at the three good things he did. Yeah. You mean like bombing Cambodia and starting an opium trade and... Did I mention the Pepsi? <laughs> <laughs> you may enjoy this anecdote about Romney. I, uh, I worked at a local TV station uh, when Romney was running for governor of Massachusetts. Uh-huh. And uh, I was working at the front desk. And he comes in and he uses our bathroom in the lobby. And there's people waiting and all this stuff. And as he comes out of the bathroom, I could almost see it. It was this cloud of the worst smelling thing I've ever encountered in my life. And you saw it, people, it just kind of came over them as it was coming towards me. And they all turned green and were nauseous. That man made the worst smell I've ever smelled in my life. And I'm like, and I, I actually said this to someone there. I go, no one who's capable of that cannot be pure evil inside. Oh my God. But what so did he eat wanted, in a child? I have no idea. And he, and we actually had to have, and, and we went in there, room was spotless. There wasn't like shit all over the place. We had to have a cleaning crew come in to like exorcise the smell. Really? And I always said that if I have no idea. I always said if if he ever, uh, you know, was running for something or or made it to president, was getting for his second term, I would have gotten a super pack together to to buy me 30 seconds of TV to just tell that story and be like, do you want to vote for him? And he's supposed to be so healthy and fit. Uh, He's Mormon. He's got yeah. magic underwear. Doesn't that cure him of uh, awful? You know, oh we're human God. beings. We have bad body smells, but it was it was inhuman. Uh, one day, this may be a false memory I have, but I remember seeing you on Midnight Caller. Yes, I was. Were you on Midnight Caller? Okay, so that was around. That was around the same time as Thank Who's you for Line. Uh, we were like yeah, a cab driver or something. Yeah, uh, Yeah, I. Uh, th- there's been two shows ever that were made in San Francisco. Yeah, actually made in San Francisco. Right. Not I'm Streets completely of San off Francisco. Mic. Um, <laughs> Uh, Nash Bridges yep. and uh, Midnight Caller. So everyone who lived in San Francisco that was a performer ended up on one of those shows. Uh, there's a Scottish show called Taggart, right? Yes. That ran for, God, 14, 15 years. And it was the only show shot in Glasgow. So literally every Scottish actor that ever lived in Scotland between right. 1985 and whatever was on the show right. Taggart. So I was on Nash Bridges. I mean, I was on uh, uh, Midnight, Midnight Caller. Caller. And my buddy Reed was on Nash Bridges. Um, so I go in for the audition, and it was a cab driver, right? Yep. And I w- it was down in some uh, Quonset hut in the industrial park. Were they like, Greg, can you just turn around and show us the back of your head? You got it. Yeah, right, <laughs> right? So uh, this will, this will, I think, amuse you. I, I wore a, a Giants cap. Okay. And I did a New York accent. Just because you wanted to? All cab drivers are from New York. Okay. <laughs> and the lines were hilarious because it was... Uh, I recognize him in the mirror, yeah. and I go, aren't you the guy on the radio? I listen to the radio. I listen to your show all the time, and I get out. You know, I'm in the cab. I get all these ideas. One of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the annoying fan. Yeah. So I loved the character. So I go, hey, aren't you the guy that's on the radio? I, you know, I'm in the cab here by myself, and I get a lot of ideas. And, like, I knew I had it. Yeah. I knew I had it the minute. Because you're the only one that had that take on it. I, it's a San Francisco cab driver. Yeah. But 
all cab drivers, because of the old movies, yes. are when from New York. Step on it. Follow that car. Yeah. Sure thing, Mac. Yeah. Right? I get them. Yeah. yeah. Even even in a, even when it's a lady cab driver, like in, a, what is it, On the Town with Frank Sinatra? Yes, it's yeah, Betty yeah. Garrett. Yeah. And she's a New York cab Okay, baby. pal. That's right. Sorry, yeah. pally. Yeah. Uh, and Which it, now they're all from the Middle East. Yeah. Now, the, of course, you would never do it now. Because the Middle East is the new New York. Yeah, is it? <laughs> and so I got the part, and I went, and we shot at night, and we were down in the uh, financial district near um, the, uh, Al- uh, not Alcoa Plaza, what's it called? Uh, Levi's Plaza. Yeah. And, um. Gary Cole's in the background. Right, and people know Gary Cole as a, a comedic actor now. Right. But this was a serious show I about a... You brought up in a... I was telling someone about it the other day. It was a cool show. Because he smoked in the studio, because yeah. you could still smoke, and he was the midnight... Uh, not only was he a, a, a bitchin' talk show host to took yeah. on all comers... He's a vigilante. He crime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because at that point, in the 80s, there was a huge wave of like, by night you fight crime, but by day you're whatever, yeah, fill in the yeah, blank yeah, job. Yeah. Yeah. He's a jar of celery. Yeah. She's, she's a smear of color. Together. Shadow Stevens fights crime. Right. That's basically what we and, have. And, and I remember his, what was the outline? He'd go, uh, good night, America, wherever you are. Yes. And he'd yeah. light a fag. Uh, and he had a Chinese engineer, because yep. it's San Francisco, yep. and we wanted to show that there's Asians. And uh, uh, he... So we're in the cab together, and I go, this neighborhood's full of yuppie fuckballs. And I remember Gary Cole laughing his ass off. Yeah. And we had pound cake and coffee. That I remember in the middle of the night. I was so excited to do it. So you cut two years later, uh, uh, the Brady Bunch movie comes out, the first yes. one. Yes, and he's, and he's the, the father, right, Mike now, Brady. Now he's found his milieu, Yeah. although he did that wonderful show for Sean Cassidy. Um, yes, American Gothic. American Gothic. Such a good show. Clearly Satan. Like it yes. was like Jim Thompson meets... It was so surreal. That show... I'm so shocked that that show has not had a revival because that One show... One season. It's more Stephen King than anything Stephen King oh, has done for television absolutely. without having anything to do and with Gary Stephen Cole's King. such a perfect choice to play that. He's this charming... Yeah. Just pure evil. Yeah. He should have been, um, uh, what's the guy in the stand? Um, right. The, uh, the Randall evil Flag. Randall Flagg. And the guy that even cast in the stand miniseries was like a like a store brand Gary Cole. <laughs> yeah, he was. It should have been Gary Cole. Yeah. Because Gary Cole could have done them. Yeah. You know, hey, why don't you come along? Well, you the, like him. Yeah, you ever see, what's the what's that one, The Killer Inside Me? With, yes. Uh, 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 the, uh, Jim Thompson. Yeah, the, the Lou French. Ford. Oh, yes, yeah. He's supposed to be, well, they did one with, I think, Casey Affleck. Casey Affleck, which is not good. Ago. There's a no. French one, isn't there? Yeah, there is. Uh, uh, and Population 320 also uh, has Population a French. Population 1280 is, 1280, um, yeah. is Coup de Torchon, uh, and they yeah. moved it to Equatorial Africa yes. instead of Texas. But, uh, the That's killer, a wonderful movie. The Killer Inside Me is one of my all-time favorite books. Well, Gary Cooper begged to play the part. Yeah. And he was completely shunted down by his agents and managers who went, you can't do this part. Because yeah. for the people who are listening, he's a small town sheriff. And he, and Plays he's, dumb. Oh, I don't. I ain't saying it is, but I ain't saying it ain't yeah. either. And finally, at the end, someone goes, cut the bullshit, Lou. Yeah. And in the meantime, he's beating the shit out of his girlfriend. He is an evil. And killing everyone. Yeah. He's, he's killing suspects. He's manipulating everybody. Yeah. yeah. It's a great character. And I always thought Gary Cole could have played it, too. Cooper, oh, of course, would have been a revelation. Yeah. But it would have ruined his career at that time. It's like a less allegorical Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah, yeah. Because... Yeah. You know, he, how you doing, ma'am? And yep. then he goes home and beats the shit yeah. out. Yeah, it's just horrible. Jim Thompson is a guy, again, who I'm like, all the TV, Breaking Bad, all these things, yeah. they're all Jim Thompson. Oh, yeah. I'm oh, like, yeah. why haven't He'd we have got been. the grifters and, uh, you know, the, the chase and all these things, mm-hmm. the getaway, as he doesn't seem to get a lot of mention no, these days. he doesn't days. get a lot of love. He wrote, he wrote by the word. He drank a lot. Was not a good guy. Uh, no, was not a good guy. His Drug runner. Was, right. His father was a hero, right? Yeah. His father was a what, sheriff in Oklahoma. Whatnot. Yeah. And uh, he used to drink at Musso's. He made he wrote two brilliant screenplays, uh, The Killing and uh, Paths of Glory. Yeah, Kubrick uh, kind of fucked him over, though, didn't Kubrick he? Kubrick did fuck him over. Uh, Mitchum loved him and um, got him to write the screenplay for one of those... Um, uh, 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 Dash uh, after dark, my sweet. Yes, in in eighty four. One of the Chandler ones, yeah, yeah, yeah. and put him in it. He's yeah. actually in. He plays General Sternwood yeah. in the remake or whatever. So it's nice to see him and stuff. But I th- I agree with you. I think I think part of it is because he wrote so many books. Yeah. The, the best five of them or six of them are classics. Yeah. And then there's a lot that are just just okay. Yeah, you know, because yeah. he he really was writing by the word. Yeah. He was getting paid by the word, and. 
Yeah, it's it's weird how he, like you said, all of pulp owes him a huge debt, and that's mainstream now. Oh, like absolutely. his his sort of aesthetic, and and, and to a lesser which degree, was outsider shit that you bought to ooh, off absolutely the boat, bottom it's, shelf to read. It's on the under train. the counter stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, his aesthetic, and and also a guy like Sam Fuller, right. who's from Worcester, Mass, yeah. and is a fascinating guy. Was a crime reporter and and got damaged by it, and and uh, you know, and this isn't for your benefit; it's for the listeners because yeah. I know I'm right. positive you know this and more than I know about it, but. Uh, those are the guys that inadvertently sort of created the, our mainstream our mainstream culture now. Yeah. And it doesn't get, but had a gravitas to it. And we, we realized that these things were evil and dark and scary yeah. and not just entertainment. And I think that's where we've, we've lost the plot a little bit. Well, Sam Fuller made that one what, POV movie where the, the prostitute kills the guy in the beginning. Yes. And, oh, can't not shock treatment. No, not Shark uh, Not Shark Corridor. It's, there's another one. My wife was showing me the beginning of it. And well, I there's lost. Lady in the Lake, or uh, that's the other POV. Oh, uh, Lady. Noir. I, don't, I don't love the Lady in the no, Lake. No, it's all gimmick. POV it's one. such a gimmick. It, it, yeah, it gets boring after a while. Yeah. It, it, one quick Sam Fuller story. My friend Nick Jones were, used to work for Film Four in acquisitions, so we would go to film festivals and stuff. Yeah. And he he said he went to one, and Sam Fuller was there. And Sam Fuller, uh, they would have like you know presentations and meetings and breakout sessions, whatnot. Yeah, yeah. At, like. Eight in the morning, Sam Fuller lit cigar. Yeah. Eight in the morning. And he was in his 70s. Yeah. Fucking come into the thing. And he was a badass. Oh, yeah. Right? And if you've ever seen the movie, um, um, Return to Salem's Lot. Uh, uh, <laughs> I killed that Nazi bastard yeah, yeah. and vampires. American Friend? Yes. It's a the American Friend. A, it's a Ripley novel, but yes. it's a, it, there's nothing to do with Ripley. Vim right. Bender's made it. It's got Dennis Hopper. And Sam Fuller's the bad guy. Yeah. And he he's carries great. a gun in it, and he's wearing a suit. Yeah. And the other director, um, the one-eyed um, uh, director, plays the artist in it. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, uh, uh, not Laszlo to talk. Uh, uh, Laszlo O'Cauley. All right, I'm blanking remember, on yeah. his name, but we'll come up with it. Yeah. So cut to the Brady Bunch opening in um, London, whenever that movie came out. 94. Yeah. They were having a party at a restaurant across the street from the comedy store. Okay. So somehow yeah. we were all Lester invited Square. to go, right? I was playing with the comedy store players. The model cafe? Yeah, but <laughs> the model cafe. I had a 20 minute routine about the cafe. I used to say, because uh, there was a picture of Claudia and Naomi and uh, who were the other two? Uh, uh, it was uh, Cindy Crawford and L. Yeah. McPherson. And I'd say, uh, Four women who've never eaten in their lives open yeah. a restaurant. Was it, was it a Claudia Schiffer's? Nothing could get through that wall of formidable SS ivory. <laughs> um, so, but uh, yeah, uh, we went to the party, the Verdi Bench party, and uh, the cast was there. And I walked up to Gary and I went, I don't know if you remember me, but I, and he went, Hi, Greg. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was four years later. Yeah. And he went, Hi, Greg. And I've never done it since, and I hate when people do it to me, and I refuse to do it. Yeah. I never do that. I bet you don't remember me, and I right. hate when people come up to me and go, I bet you don't Because that's a way me. of saying, like, hey, you're probably an asshole. Mm -hmm. That They might as well just say that. Why not just go, we met on this. Yeah. You're a real fucking jerk. You met me before. Right. <laughs> like, wh what a weird way to do it. Yeah. I introduce myself to everybody in Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, anywhere, all the time. And people go, some people, hilariously, especially in England, where, you know, uh, the they, they're not always the warmest. No. I'll go, hi, I'm Greg Proops. And people will go like, I know. Yeah. And then I'll go, no, no, no. This is where you tell me your name. Yeah. And we say Who hi to you? each other and how do you do? And yeah. then they get really yeah. looking, oh, you're going to do that. Stop being so American. Right. Well, it's like, you know, the reason I'm telling you is not because I'm being a dick. I'm yeah. trying to inform you. Right. I'm My trying to be a human. Was Heston. He's, I was listening to an interview with him and he said someone came up to him at a party and went, I bet you don't remember me or whatever. And he went, because he's Charlton Heston, he's so yeah. awesome. Help me. <laughs> <laughs> my, my favorite Heston quote is, uh, there's a EPK, yeah. uh, Electronic Press Kit, yeah. on the DVD of the Omega Man. Oh my God, and, uh, the Omega Man. And for some reason, he wanted to learn how to actually draw blood and synthesize serums. So he went to a hospital and, and learned this it's stuff. For my character. My character. I'm a major in the army. And they, they show this footage of this person taking blood from him. He's given blood. Wow. And they go, this will tell us how much iron is in your blood and whatever. And he goes, do you have a machine that can show the level of passion in a man's blood? <laughs> And he's he completely really serious. He really he asked us. He asked this nurse, and she's like, no. Yeah, <laughs> no. Like, That's the kind of guy we miss now. Oh, I love No it. irony. No, no, no. It's completely no, no. sincere, bizarre, yeah. bizarre, bizarre. That's fantastic. It's great. My wife's always, I used to do a joke about it. My wife's always on me for liking Charles Heston. She goes, he's a fascist and he can't act. And I'm like, precisely. Yeah. That's why I love That's him. That's why you love him. Um, 
I put him and Kirk Douglas up as the two actors who never played anyone lovable. No. They didn't even play dads or boyfriends. Nope. They very even rarely love a woman in a movie, and when they do, it's like you say with Haston, what's the Hawaiian one? Oh, yeah. Leilani, you know how to make a man feel I like a man. You. Yeah, like it. Well, like Touch of Evil. He's the romantic lead. Right, he's the romantic what? lead. But, he's um, also Mexican. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not here as a policeman. I'm here as a husband. Yeah. Are you? I no, don't believe you. No. But even him, so there's a right way. He's wing. always an asshole. He's an movies. asshole. He, he never plays a likable character. There's even a... in Greatest Show on Earth, when the train's oh, on. Oh, yeah. He goes, get this train off of me. You're like, what the fuck? You're dying. You know? But there's a right wing guy, huh? and he's in some of the most left wing dystopian wa- sci fi. Right right? yeah. He was a big civil rights advocate yeah. and marched and all that stuff. It was somewhere in the 70s or 80s, he, he got kookier and then right. the gun thing yeah and then the whole iced tea thing was like crazy yeah. like something clicked in his brain and like no chuck you see we did fight a war so that he could say cop killer yeah because black people are killed by cops and it's an issue yeah and he was kind of blind on that side oh yeah i mean i think but he, he was, was a fascist I yeah mean, but him and reagan both were kind of suffering dementia anyway <laughs> yeah they were and now, now we know for a fact that he did yeah. have it uh, yeah but yeah, he made a lot of left-wing movies. Yeah. Planet of the Apes is a left-wing Soylent movie. Soylent Green. Soylent Green is a wildly left-wing uh, yeah. uh, movie. Omega Man. Omega, Omega Man. Man. You know, it, it's about a new society yeah. rising up. and and He's always killed at the end, too. Yes, he He's is. got that Mel Gibson thing. Although I, want, He wants to be tortured and killed. Yeah, I could have done without the Jesus allegory in the Omega Man that was not in the book. It was, when he's laying there yeah. in, the, in the fountain with at the, the end. With a spear in his side. Yeah, yeah, and the literally the spear. a spear yeah, in his yeah, side yeah, yeah. as the salvation and of he humanity. He drops the serum, but they quickly pick it up. Yeah, which is the thing that I, you know, I hated about the Will Smith one is it, the oh. whole point of the book being I am legend you're the old society and you're a monster mm-hmm. you've been reading this book from the monster's point of view the whole time and don't realize until yeah. the end which as a kid reading that I was like holy shit yeah, you know it, I am legend is that the one yeah yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. like you're the lead you're the you're the horror story we tell our children you come and kill us in our sleep and yeah. that's what makes you question war and that's what makes we're not the good guys we thought we were the good guys that's the whole Richard time Madison, right? you're Richard Matheson yeah. yep yeah um, and that sort of thing I think is gone now. Now the other part they never do in any of the three versions because I talked I've talked about it a lot yeah. on my show. The, the awesome Vincent Price one, Last Man, Last on Man Earth. on Earth, which gets the atmosphere. Yeah, it gets the atmosphere. But in the book, I remember the vampire women take their tops off and try to yes. get him to come out of his house because he hasn't had a woman in right, years. He he's yeah. been living alone. You're all freaks. Yeah, and then when he parks uh, near the museum in a red zone. Uh, I remember one of the lines in the book is there's never a cop around when you need one. Yeah. And, like he's got a, sen- a morbid sense of humor. Yeah. Well, he's about losing his, his mind. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a book about someone losing the their mind. The one is good because I always say like, so there you are, the last person on earth. And so what is it you decide to do? Exterminate. Yeah. And watch Woodstock every yeah, day. Right. Watch Woodstock <laughs> in a theater by yourself. Yeah. And he has that uh, map where he goes through every neighborhood in L.A. to make sure he's exterminated yeah. the zombies. He's a monster. And, yeah, yes. Because they're really... And he's right-wing gun-toting. Yeah. And they're, although insane, they're basically a communal... Uh, you know, communist mm-hmm. uh, or, or sort of the hippie dream almost. Right, you right. know, they're living together and they're they're Brother living Timothy. off the land. Yeah. Oh, uh, what's his name? Anthony uh, Zerby. Anthony Zerby. He scares the shit out of me. He's even scary in that movie as the newscaster before he gets right. the disease. I couldn't sleep when I saw it. I, I was up for me. like two nights. When My I saw dad it. used to go. We'd see a movie like that. We'd see a movie like Red Dawn, and he'd go, "That could happen." <laughs> That's what he would say to me. That's what <laughs> that he'd say. Happen. And I'm like, "Thank you." You mean for... the zombie apocalypse? Yeah, or just like, yep. Talk about uh, not giving anyone credit. Uh, uh, Richard Madison uh, thought of all of these. Yes. They're zombie vampires who are controlling the world because yeah. man has destroyed everything and da 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 da. da. And I mean, that's what Romero will tell you. I got it from. And Romero doesn't get the credit yeah, for it. Romero, um, all of his movies. The thing when I am legend that. And he, everyone's wrong except the black guy. Yeah. In exactly. Night of the Living Dead. Yeah. The black guy says, we mustn't go out there. Yeah. Well, the thing I always explain the, the, the whole, um, you know, I'm sorry I'm taking so much of your time. That's right all right. But um, the thing that I, I've always loved. Not zombie enjoying movies. this at all. I know. I'm, he, he's miserable right now, everybody. <laughs> Um, he's doing scratch tickets. Uh, the uh, <laughs> the thing I always loved about zombie movies was not the not the wish fulfillment. Mm. It was not the oh I'd like to have no people around and take whatever I want. Right. It was it was seeing how humanity fucked it up for themselves, and that yeah. was Romero's point the whole time. It was always if we just worked together in the beginning, this wouldn't have been a problem. Yeah. And it doesn't matter that it's zombies; it could be killer ducks. Yeah. It's that we didn't work together, and we argued, and we had a religious point, or we had a political point, and we were vying for power, and that's where we fucked up. Right. Nothing 
gets that now. Mm-mm. It's all about, yeah, you can mow these things down, and it's like killing people, but they're not people, so it doesn't fucking matter. Right, right, and it's right. this sort of weird survivalist wish fulfillment, and that scares me. Yeah. The point was never that. Even in one of my favorite ones we showed it a couple years ago at one of my uh, film clubs was uh, Return of the Living Dead. Yeah. The Dan, Dan O'Bannon, O'Bannon, 85. Because that's the most nihilistic zombie movie of Absolutely. all time. Absolutely. The government kills everybody. The government kills everybody. When the zombies attack, there's no stopping them. And unlike in other zombie movies, they can run. Yep. They can be, they're organized. Yep. And they know how to manipulate the system. Yeah. So send more cops. You send more cops. <laughs> They're not even they're they're yeah. not helpless in any way. Yeah, and uh, they tend to always make them slow moving and this yeah. and that. You can't kill them. You can only wipe a few of them out in the yeah. movie. And then at the end, it's the end of the world. Yeah, like it's the worst ending for what is supposed to be basically a comedy, which yeah. it is. It's it's, it's a, a grim, dark comedy. comedy. In in the, that one, that's scary. And I I postulated this theory uh, on a on a a prior episode but I I see this obsession with sort of fantasy and magic and all these things in the mainstream now that wasn't when we were growing up I mean that was the realm of people like us you had to like sci-fi you had to like sci-fi you had to search it out uh, and all these things and it's mainstream now and I and I think that the reason sort of millennials gravitate towards it is because it's all about rules Mm. it's very hard rules if you say these words this magic thing happens Uh if if there's this kind of monster, this is how you kill it. And uh-huh. if it's a zombie, you shoot it in the head and it dies. Right. But Return of the Living Dead is pure anarchy. There's no rules. There's no uh-uh. one. If you're moral, doesn't matter. Uh-uh. You're getting killed the same right. way. Uh, you can't stop them. There's no logic to it. Mm-mm. It's and the terrifying. Government, it's the government's and the fault. government, the government started it in the it. first yeah. place yeah. and also made it worse by trying to fix it at yeah. the end. Yeah. And that is, I think, why that movie, although is it has a, a big cult audience, yeah. it's still a cult audience yeah. because it doesn't have that fantasy fulfillment or you can't ignore that part of it. Mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. And I don't know if people agree with that or not, but it seems like th- because there's no rules and all the right. horror movies that I and I'm a huge horror guy and all the horror movies that are mainstream now are ones with rules. It's about possessions. It's about ghosts and you can cleanse a place. You can exercise, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's these movies with rules The the jigsaw, you know, in, yeah. in the, in the saw movies, he has rules. If you pass his test, you are fine. Right. It's not just some psycho killing people for no reason, like in Halloween. Right. And, and that's strange to me. It is. You're, you're very right about that. That's interesting because I've watched it in my lifetime. Sci-fi was very ghettoized and horror was uh, low budge. Yeah. Other than like the Paramount stuff in the 40s, which is classy, but uh, uh, I'm sure they thought of it as oh, yeah. second string. It was Poverty Row stuff. Yeah, Poverty yeah. Row stuff. Uh, and then Kubrick is the first one to elevate it to this giant level. Because the difference between, say, like Forbidden Planet and right. uh, 2001 is that 2001 is a, an impenetrable philosophical treatise yeah. on top of a sci fi right. movie. Or under a sci-fi movie. Forbidden Planet's The Tempest. And Forbidden Planet is The Tempest with yeah. all the incest and, and yeah. uh, 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 delusional the king and, and uh, talk about wanting the sum total knowledge of the universe right. and what it does to you and all that. And of course the Americans are all yeah. we'll regu- take regular this. guys. We like pussy. And yeah. I'm just basically a plumber in space. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. right. You've been wearing a plumber's outfit. Yeah. And then uh, uh, I think it's really, uh, and then this is patently obvious, but... Star Wars is the moment when yeah. it, it, the not only for blockbuster movies, but to take sci-fi from one. Um, now it's for everybody. Yeah, not just well, people who like spaceships. All of our mainstream movies are B movies and cult movies. Yeah, everything that comic books, uh, comic books, shit that would have been exactly everything on, on AIP cartoon, was doing in the car chase movies, mm-hmm. Fast and Furious. Right. Those are Roger Corman stuff. Yeah, uh, you know horror movies. Right, that's go- gone in sixty yeah, seconds. that's the biggest yeah. movies now, and it's. I, two things. I was never a sci-fi guy until I became an adult, mm-hmm. uh, and I was always a horror guy because, to me, uh, and I've since revised this opinion, but to me, sci-fi was horror with too much explanation. Right. You know, I was like, well, you've just explained it now, and now it's not scary. Right. But now it's more scary. And I also thought that sci-fi was not a pure genre; it had to be mixed with something else. So, like, uh, Aliens is the best. Example. I was going to say Alien. Yeah, the first Alien, haunted house movie. Second one's a war movie. Third one's a prison movie. Mm-hmm. They're not sci-fi movies. No, uh, no, no. They're genre movies. They're with, genre with movies. Sci-fi. With sci-fi, but now I see that sci-fi. Right, and the fourth one's a mess. Yeah, is a mess movie. Uh, is a pure genre, and it you don't see it anymore. You don't see pure sci-fi movies like uh, I think the last one was probably Minority Report. Right, and that was a terrifying movie. 
Yeah. I found that movie terrifying. Uh, I, my only objection was I didn't find Tom Cruise convincing. Also, I didn't think Spielberg should have directed no. it. No. It was far. It was far too over budgeted. Yeah. Uh, but, but the I, I predictive stuff was amazing. Yeah, I love the. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the paranoia and raging meth-fueled delusion of, of Philip yeah. K. Dick and his anticipation of all those things. Philip K. Dick is the counterculture, yeah. the true counterculture. And you have Spielberg and Tom Cruise in his movie? That's what didn't work for me. It was yeah. like, he, I love the idea of a detective who can pre... You predetermine who the criminals are through a series of, you know, gyrations with the computer, this and that. Which people would do now. Right. <laughs> and, and then at night... He goes out on the street looking for drugs yeah. because he's a fucking mess. Yeah, because you can't live with that. He's not a lawman. Yeah. He's, a, he's a criminal yeah. who's now been stuck in the middle. And he's getting more and more delusional because he can't yeah. reconcile the two things. And that's what didn't work for me as the thing. But yes, it is a up. pure sci-fi uh, 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 premise. I think that's really interesting what you said about the rules and all that. Because I, I don't mind that pulp fiction and pop culture have schlockified everything to the maximum power. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of fun but as the, a fan. The big of objection for me is like, I don't, uh, I, I like, you, you have to go to independent films and foreign films to get character studies and content. Yeah. Because Hollywood has no interest in doing that. Doesn't make money. At all anymore. Yeah. And so what once was where you would have a, a studio system make The Godfather and yeah. Chinatown and uh, also... Blade Runner. Right. <laughs> then now it's Fast and Furious 100 and, you know... Yeah. I can't get excited about comic book movies. They don't interest no. me. And I'm a huge comic book fan. Right. I, I grew up loving this stuff. And I and people always say to me, like, you must be like a pick and shit yeah. with this. And I go, no, it's terrible. Because it's like, uh, it's not the same. Like, I hated liking comics as a kid. I hated having a subscription to Fangoria. I cursed my interests. I was like, I kind of wish I didn't like this stuff. You know, I kind of wish I couldn't. I, I wish I could unsee these things. Mm. Uh as much as I love them. Uh, but now people don't, they don't sort of suffer for them. Mm -mm. And it's, it's, you've taken the thing that I love and, and I, and you've changed it into something that it's not. And, and it, it's, it's not the same. I, no. I can't quite, I can't quite well, express it. The most blowback to use a word I've never used before. <laughs> uh, you heard it here first, everybody. Yeah. It, it, that I've ever had on any of my episodes uh, was, uh, I watched Pacific Rim, right? Right. I was on a plane and I watched it. And I I took a hack at it on the show. And I got a million emails. Um, You're wrong. Uh, Idris Elba's in it. He's a great actor. Um, don't you get that it's a female yeah. character? That's on paper, sure. And da 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 da. It's a monster I, movie. It's right, my point was that, like, when monsters keep coming up from the bottom of the ocean yeah. and every one of them has to be killed by a robot that punches them to death, yeah. it's a Toho movie from 1960. Yeah, without the fun. Right. <laughs> yeah. There's no funny costumes. They right. played it really serious. Where's the mushroom people? Yeah. And, and, and everyone got on my dick and was like, no, it's this illuminating thing. And I was like, it isn't. Because if the monster just keeps being generated from the bottom yeah. of the ocean for no reason yeah. and they're the same protoplasmic bullshit every time... There's no moral underpinning. There's no fucking overarching theme. There's well, no that's... anything to it. It's just a monster movie with a robot punching yeah. monsters. So make it fun. Make right. it a Ron. Make it Ultraman. You right, know? right. But make it campy or make there have a reason why the right. monsters keep appearing. Well, it's like people. It's us. We're manifesting right. them. Or we're it's the, the monster. government. Right. Or it's Back to Forbidden Planet, which yeah. is, you know, I, people always give me shit because I don't really like Twin. Quentin Tarantino movies. Yeah. And the reason is I, I, I always say he's sort of the cinematic puff daddy. He's sampling things you've mm -hmm. never heard of and making it something right. that you're like, oh, this is really cool. Yeah. And that's fine, but I, you know, not to sound snobby, but I like City on Fire. Yeah. I've seen it, you know, right. it's not new to me. And just like Pacific Rim, it's like, yeah, I watched all the Toho movies. I would rather see that or do a version of that that's, that's more interesting. Um, it's funny you say that about Tarantino because... I think there's lots of millennials uh, who they've never seen the old movies. So they've never seen a Hong Kong film or they've right. never seen the 70s pictures that he's yeah. pulling everything from. And I recognize that. I mean, I used to go to the Shaw Brothers Theater in Boston and watch movies in Cantonese. I had no fucking clue what they were saying. Right. I was 12, and I'm like, this is crazy. Yeah. I'm seeing the bride with the white hair, and it yeah. just looks amazing. Yeah. And it was like, I remember seeing some guy say Django was the most amazing movie he'd ever seen. It blew his mind. He'd never seen anything like it. And I was like, well... It's a combination of 
uh, uh, every Fred Williamson movie yeah. and all the Mandingo movies yeah. mixed with uh, uh, other exploitation. Yeah. It, it, the treatment of slavery and cruelty in it is kind of shocking. Yeah. It's not very informed. And then I said to my wife hadn't seen it, and I said at one point him and uh, Ellen, the, what was the movie, The Skin Game with uh, yeah. uh, James Garner, where he keeps yeah. selling the same slave over and over. It looks cool though, man. Well, uh, they're they're riding along him and Christoph Walsh, uh, 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 Jamie Fox and Christoph Walsh are riding along, and all of a sudden, I've got a name by Jim Croce comes on the soundtrack, yeah. and I was like. This is the most... So on the nose, everybody. What the fuck? Yeah. Like, you're kidding, right? Well, you like, just threw in the song from 1974 because you remembered it? Yeah. And and then and someone who's 29 has never seen a movie goes... Crazy! Man, this is fucking awesome. And it's like, yeah. all I could think about what poor Carrie Washington was, she had to be naked in that fucking box. Yeah. And that's all I could think about when I saw the movie. I didn't think... It wasn't an indictment of slavery. It wasn't an indictment of the Confederacy. It had nothing to do with anything... It was a crappy fantasy film sort of yeah. stuck on, like the Inglorious Bastards, right. one, which isn't even a remake of Inglorious no, Bastards. which is a movie I liked, yeah. 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 Um, so, I, 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 for me, like, I like Jackie Brown best of all of his pictures. But that's the least Tarantino because movie. Because it's a character study. Yeah. And the violence is incidental to the characters. The is it James is Elroy that characters. it's based on a James uh, Elroy book? Call it? it's, uh, Guy did uh, LA Confidential? No, uh... Is it? Yeah. I think so. It's called Rum... Elmore Leonard. Elmore Leonard. That's Rum, what Yeah. Rum Punch, I think. Is yeah, yeah, real. yeah. Because that has a source material that's not Tarantino. And, and making her, uh, the middle-aged characters, yeah. uh, 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 people who are, you know, not your normal heroes, and... Uh, uh, I really think that one is like his best constructed. And it absolutely it's is. It's slow moving, but then also the music fits. Like, yeah. She puts on the record of uh, 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 the Delphonics. Because she would. Right. It's because not, that's look her at my era. record collection, no, no, no. man. Look how cool I yeah. am. And I think people confuse. And then later he buys it and plays it because yeah. he loves her. They right. fall in love with each other. It's integral to the plot. <laughs> yeah. So when you keep hearing the song, it's yeah. not just throwing in, I've got a name. Right. To, on, in a movie from the, that's supposed to be in the 1860s. Yeah. But it's crazy, man. That's art. I mean, to to sort of, um, as much as I could do this all day, and yeah, talk to you know, I've got to eat I'm sure you have to eat. Um, to, to sort of wrap wrap it up, the, the, what we're talking about at the beginning here about sci-fi in the, in the 60s and 50s and making us question things, if you look at things we've talked about now, Scientology, mm. that's an actual fucking thing. Yeah. That would have been a Outer Limits or Twilight Zone yeah. episode. Or going into a studio and doing TV where you don't see a real human being. Mm -hmm. It's all robots. Someone's interviewing you on a TV mm -hmm. screen. You're not interacting with another human being. You're traveling the world, but you're like, I could be in the same box. I could be in Cube. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know. That's a real thing you've experienced. Yeah. And that is... Picture phones, yeah. which every sci-fi movie had. That's a textbook example of yeah. dystopian sci-fi. Yeah. And every day I'm reminded of this stuff. And it's crazy that we don't question them and it doesn't no. scare people. And we're not making media that really points that out anymore. I agree. I mean, that's... I think... Well, Quentin Tarantino has no responsibility to make a factual movie. No. Uh, whether he wants to make these fantasy movies about World War II and the Civil right. War, that's totally his prerogative, and I'm sure he feels that. Uh, but having said that, like to address what you just said, I feel, uh, uh, maybe not a responsibility, it's my motivation on my podcast to talk about exactly what you're talking about. Right. That we're in a dystopian time, that other people have talked about this, that there's frames of reference for it, that you have to understand the information that you're being bombarded with, that yeah. advertising is... Uh, an evil, pernicious thing, and that it's completely out of control. Right. You literally can't go on anything on the web without an ad popping up. Yeah. Without uh, a targeted ad, like in right, <laughs> what, right. for you specifically. Right. Uh, my my joke that get that always gets a laugh, and I've been doing this joke for about three years before the WikiLeaks, uh, Edward Snowden, and Chelsea Manning. Uh, was that the government and the corporations gave us phones so yep. that we wouldn't pay attention to the people we love and the matter at hand, and that uh, they could spy on us because a phone is... A, and, of course, GPS. I was right. Yeah. Not, not that it required a great deal of prescience, <laughs> right. but it's funny to see the joke in context before and after the information. So when I used to do it, people would be like, ah, ha, 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 or they'd get huffy with me. Yeah. And be like, no, that's my love, my phone. Nice conspiracy theory, jerk. Right. And, yeah. and then, of course, oh, no, every email... Yeah. So I said the phone is a, uh, it's a microphone. It's listening. Yep. It's a camera. It's watching. When it's off, 
It's a GPS. And it's a, 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 a when you use it to buy things, they, they're keeping yeah. absolute track of everything you're doing at all times. It's a control device. It's not a device of freedom. Yeah. And then I, the joke is, you go to the store, you buy a bunch of bananas, and the next day you open up your Facebook page, and there's an ad that says, would you like to meet women who like bananas? Yeah. And it's the truth, and people laugh at it now because they recognize it. But I, I've watched, I don't even... I'm sometimes even sketchy about telling the joke anymore because the reality of it is... It's not even a joke now. It's not a joke. It's <laughs> yeah. super... Four years ago when I started telling it, yeah. I remember doing Edinburgh and uh, one of the critics said, everyone's talking about cell phones this year at the Fringe, at the Edinburgh Fringe. Yeah. Four or five comics had routines about cell phones. And it was like, because we're thinking about it. Yeah. The perniciousness and the, uh, the, the, uh, the control element of yeah. what... Uh, uh, so, like mine's on right now and it's sitting in my coat so yeah. clearly we could be heard yeah. and monitored if, if they were of a mind to do that now right. information gathering is a leviathan process yes. thank god uh, but with facial recognition and voice recognition it's all gonna you lived in England you know that there's no place in the world CCTV. that you're more likely to be on camera yeah. and that George Orwell in 1984 uh, Winston goes into the, the toilet in one of the scenes when he's working at the Ministry of Truth yeah and he says, there was no place you could be more certain that you were being monitored. Yeah. When Which, you're alone in the toilet. But I think people find comfort in that now instead of being terrified by it. Someone's watching me, uh, so I'm okay. It's like I'm being babysat. But, but who, you know, like Napoleon said, they said, who, who will watch the criminals in the jails? And he said, right. bigger criminals. Here's, a, here's the thing I don't know if you did when you were in England. Did you ever go to the milk bar that Orwell used to hang out at and wrote? Um, no, Nelson? no, no. Do you know what it is now? Uh-uh. McDonald's. Oh yeah, of course. It's there a McDonald's are. on Oxford Oxford Street. Oh yeah, the one on Oxford. I Street. went in there and I'm like, this was where 1984 wow. was created, and now it's a McDonald's. Well, I lived in Hampstead, and he fantastically lived up the road in what's called the Vale of Health. Yes, and he was the least healthy person that I think he made it to what 50 something like that. Yeah, chain smoker. He had <laughs> TB. He got shot during the Spanish Civil War. He just like, you know, I I just wrote a book uh, to put a plug in, and. Uh, the, one of the few arguments that I had with my editor, he was a very good Matthew Benjamin at, at, at Touchstone. He helped me and guided me quite a lot when I was writing the book because I had no idea what I was doing. Right. And uh, I didn't know what viewpoint to take. I didn't know what person to speak it in. But we got to a chapter, and it was about books. And I have this giant thing on Orwell in there. And then uh, he gave me the great notion of, rather than describe the books, um, do... Um, the, the, the modern thing, no one has time to listen to the description right. of a book. So you're going to summarize a book in one line, yeah. the blink and you miss it review, right. and then do a bio of the author. Yeah. So now you have all the context for the right. book, but you don't, ha you don't you know have where to, it came from. Right, and I don't spoiler alert and all that. And, and in my lexicon, I have a lexicon in the book as well, I put Orwellian in there yeah. and a bunch of other ones like oligarchy and kleptocracy and all these things because people bandy these words around. They don't know where they come but from. But they don't know where they come from and they don't know what they mean. And I said, it's imperative that if you're going to use the word Orwellian and You've Big read Brother, 1984. that you understand where it came from. Yeah. And he went, there's too much of Orwell. You've got too much of it in here. And I said, that was the one point I argued in one. I went, there's not enough. There's too much in our world now. Right. I said, we're living in this bloody Orwellian, you know, dystopia, blah, blah. Uh, and, of course, he wasn't right about every single right, thing. Right. It's, it's more of a combo platter of Aldous Huxley yes. and Zemmeyan and Heinlein. And, yeah, Heinlein, which I just read last year. Yeah. He could have been president. I think if Heinlein was around now, that asshole would and be speaking president. Speaking of Scientology, another naval uh, yeah. officer. Like, and, and Frank Herbert also yeah. was a, a sailor, too, right? Like, oh, yeah. All, all these great sci-fi minds were all in the fucking yeah. naval Weird. services. Uh, we ever on Room 101? No, no, no. That was such a weird show in England. Um, oh, oh, the TV show. The TV course. show. Sure, yeah. Because that's a comedy show. Right, about the about worst thing in the things world. things you hate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's based on a terrifying notion right. in he says in the book, what's in Room 101? And I think uh, O'Brien says, the worst thing in the world. Yeah. For some people, it's not even fatal, he yeah. says. Yeah. It could just be having ants crawl on you yeah. or whatever. For you, Winston, it's rats. Yeah. And takes the cage right out of his eye line, and he hears the rats jumping around, and that's when he killed Julia. And that's a show that I enjoyed. It's a fun yeah, comedy yeah, yeah. show in England. Was it Nick Hancock? Uh, no, I think it's... Um, uh, I remember who the host was. Oh, man, it's a guy you were in Whose Line with um, oh. Paul Merton. Did he host it, though? I think he did, Room 101. I thought 
thought he was the guest on it. You're right. You're probably right. And he's be. a mate of mine. Yeah. Um, that. But a show that I liked. <laughs> but I think that shows how how far we've come. We take right. a thing that's an absolutely yeah. bone chilling, well, terrifying concept. Yeah, Big Brother. It's a fun show about people doing it. Right. You know we, I mean? we get them drunk. We hope they fuck. We 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 put the camera on them every. And people love having the camera on them all the time. Uh, uh, Kim Kardashian might be the most, you know, significant cultural signifier yeah. of the last because she isn't pretending to yeah. do what she's doing and she does have a job people are always like she doesn't have a job she doesn't do anything it's like she's doing her yeah. job you're you're patronizing her job i mean this is a slight tangent but the to take pictures of herself is her job yeah that's her job yeah. to make a leaked porno uh -huh. movie uh, but i think if you get far enough away from a horrific thing Pop culture can latch onto it mm -hmm. and make it warm and fuzzy. Yeah. And the example I always bring up, and people think I'm an asshole every time I do this, when someone ever orders the drink an Irish car bomb, yeah. I always go, oh, how long till we have a drink called the Iraqi insurgent uh -huh. IED? Uh -huh. And they're like, what are you talking about? People die from those. And I'm like, you just ordered a fun drink with the girls yeah. that killed people in the 70s. Oh, sure. But you're okay with it because it's far enough away ago. Right, and right. Big Brother is far enough away ago that it's a fun show with yeah. boobs in it. Right. And that's the terrifying thing that I think we should be making media about and questioning in our, in our fiction. Well, I, and, and I'm never going to stop doing that. And the, like, for instance, uh, I have a, a, a car, and it's a new one, and I don't think it's got a computer that's watching me yet. Uh, but <laughs> that's what next. it would want you to think. And uh, uh, what's next, I think, for everyone and uh, the technology, which isn't benign in any way. Right. Um, I refuse to believe that simply because things get more convenient that there's a, a, a there's humanistic a impulse. Yeah. Uh, and I'm always pointing out, and I'm going to carry on, the subject of my next podcast is going to be about how venal all the tech people are in Silicon Valley and how their agenda is... I mean, I brought it up in the last show. No different than people who make munitions and sell yeah. them to third world countries. They Profit and growth are the definition of a corporation. In any case, the next step for cars and whatnot uh, will be... Uh, there'll be a breathalyzer, there'll be a camera, there'll be sensors so that if you're high or you smoke a cigarette or you stop at McDonald's too much, the insurance companies will be able to collect and collate Change that rates. information and raise your rate. And then the, uh, uh, their allied insurance companies will be able to rise your health insurance. You know what you do? You eat at Burger King too fucking much. Yeah. No, I don't. Sure, here's the data. Here's all of the data. Yeah. Uh, they can collate your credit card thing, your thing, thing, thing. Um, the insidiousness I find in companies like Uber uh, and, and Airbnb is that they're a bit lawless and they go around uh, um, regulation. Regulation, but also uh, the, the lack of the lack of control leads to uh, people being raped and, and violated. Well, it's and dehumanized. And There's no boss. You know, right? it's a, it's a, you put it on your phone. You never talk to a person. You could get in the Uber and not even talk to the person yeah. driving. There's no accountability. There's no, there's no Tom Bodette. No, there's no guy. I'm the president of the company. Right. If you have a problem, come to me. Right. You know, there's even Lee Iacocca. You know what I mean? Like he was a human being. I could go, I drove my, what was it? General Motors. Yeah. My car blew up. I'm going to go to Lee Iacocca and say he's an yeah, asset. Yeah, yeah. There's no one to do that. Well, no. To on the other night we were in Santa Barbara doing a gig and uh, we were, my wife and I were having a walk and uh, a drunken bar and people spilling out the bar and whatnot. Row of cabs. Yep. Row of cabs. And, uh, all, all New York cab drivers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah right, right. <laughs> all Pakistani New York yep. cab drivers because it's the new, uh, UN. and, um, a, a girl teeters out of the bar, and there's a car parked up there, and she goes, are you my Uber driver? And he goes, uh-huh. Sure. And she jumps in. And I thought, at the very basic level of primitive human survival, and yeah. women know this better than anyone, you mustn't do that. Yeah. And it, it, that, I feel, is a gross violation of the human contract. It's like running someone over in a crosswalk. If you get in a car for hire... You're likely with 99 out of 100 cab rides, maybe one for once in a while someone's yeah. an asshole, but that's the worst of it. They don't stop and kill you. They don't rip you off. You know what I mean? Like yeah. sometimes they take you the long way or whatever, but the, the, the human contract requires that we be able... There's an assumption of rules. Well, if you go to a restaurant 
almost everything in your life you pay for first. Yeah. But at a restaurant, you pay after. Right. Because you have to decide whether you like it or not. Yeah. Or whether it merits you to pay. If you don't like it within a couple of bites, you can send the fucker back and yeah. walk the fuck out. Yeah, like children. Right. And, <laughs> but uh, uh, the, uh, the convenience, like you say, there's always a cost, but no one weighs that. No. They would rather just be... I have had women say to me, I'm addicted to Uber, and I always want to say to them, the amount of cab drivers that assault their... Uh, uh, patrons as a, opposed to Uber is quite minimal. Right. My wife always says to me when we lived in London, as you know, if you call the black cab or a regular car like an Addison Lee they're car, vetted. They're vetted. They also have to have the knowledge. And they have to have the knowledge. Mini but cab. if you called a mini cab, you could be taken. My wife yeah. said she got in a mini cab once and the guy started taking it the wrong way. Oh, yeah. And they were f- notorious in London it's for like human assaulting traveling. women. Yeah. And, uh, it was I, Uber 30 years ago. Yeah. I remember getting in a mini cab in North London and because uh, I was trying to do two gigs in a night, right? Yeah. Like I was at the Red Rose in North London and I wanted to go to Leicester Square to do a set at the store. And I got in a cab and this is the parochialism of London too. London's such a giant city with what, 10, 15 million yeah. people. and It's as big as LA. It's so spread out. Yeah. It really goes out to the M25. Yeah. It's LA, New York basically. Right. It's yeah. like this giant, like, like Orwell predicted, it's Airstrip One. Yeah. It's this insane mass yeah and there's so many immigrants who aren't assimilated and i got in the cab and the cab driver was probably african and i said because you know africa is a country it's not a series of different countries and it's not the biggest continent of the world that every other country could fit in and it's not the source of humanity it's simply a country called africa i think she was nigerian or whatever but i said i want to go to leicester square and she went what's leicester square yeah and it's like, you're a cab driver in London. That's like one of three right. places like you, you got should in a know. cab in Boston and we went yeah. take me to the commons. And they went, what's the what commons? What is that? You want to go to East Boston? Yeah, right. That's all I know. And, and I had to guide her yeah. to take me all the way to the center of London, which is where everything is. And yeah. I thought, you've never been to the center of London. And then I, I got a ride home with one of the uh, uh, bouncers at the comedy store once. And I lived in Hampstead, like I said, in yep. MW3, which is a very white people Yeah place Hampstead to live Heath. yeah it was uh, Glenda Jackson was our MP yeah to give you an idea like Michael Palin lived there yeah you know? yeah and uh, Peter Cook lived across the way from us uh, and uh, 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 he's from uh, he's not from Jamaica he was from another island I can't remember which island. The Caribbean yeah yeah definitely you know six kids with five yeah. different women you know like a real yeah. Londoner was it know? Billy Ocean <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to be my lover boy yeah and, and I, I got out of his dreams. Oh, from Trinidad. And into his car. Licensed Taylor. Yeah. and uh, Was he? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, but anyway, he gave me a ride home, and he'd, he'd never been to North London. Yeah. He'd never been across that border of yeah. Camden Town to that area. And I was like, you know how to get home, mate? And he's like, hmm. I'll find it, Greg. You know? yeah. And I'm like, no, you can't go back down the high street yeah. and just carry on. Cab driver person, I assume, has the knowledge to do this. And it's I, like going to a doc, not quite like going to a doctor, but you go in and you're like, I have a foot problem. And they're like, well, I studied lungs, right. but uh, if you could guide me through it, maybe yeah, we could do, do it. This. Yeah, let's do this together. It's sort of breaking that contract. And technology won't make it better. GPS means people won't have to learn it. Well, I, I'm as guilty as that of anyone else. I, I used to have to find my way uh, uh as a road comic, yeah. when I was an opener and when I was a featured act, uh, drive to fucking yep. Seattle, then find the gig in Portland, wherever that was. Yeah. I remember doing road trips with other comics where we'd have a map out Make and we're it like, back alive. Right, and then get to, <laughs> yeah. oh, we've got to find a, th- yeah. this Mexican restaurant in Salem, Oregon, yeah. do the fucking gig, then get to the next town. Yeah. There was no cell phones, there was no GPS. You did it with maps and fucking, oops, Can we missed our exit. It? Shit, yeah. we got to double back. And uh, you phone calls to oh, yeah. clubs, which meant pulling over. Finding a phone. Uh, finding yeah. a phone. Uh, and I was able to do all that. Yeah. And now I'm incapable of it. But you had a skill. <laughs> and, and to sort of bring it back to, to TV Guide, yeah. we sat and we planned our week. Yeah. We saw, you made choices about things that Shows you wanted that, yeah. to watch. If you missed it, you missed it. If you, if you saw a life-changing thing, you saw it. Yeah. And it had a weight to it. And these shows stuck with you at that yeah. age because you actively participated in the, the finding of it and you sort of absorb it. You, you were a participant in watching it. And now, there's probably 20 TV guides in this table and the two of us on our phones could probably watch every single show in these right now on our phones. Yeah. And it sort of means nothing. That's the weird part. Like, my show, uh, my podcast, 
is an archivist kind of thing. You know, I talk about a lot of old movies, right. books, this, this, this. And I have a lot of young people listening, which warms my heart. Because in my, I'm in my 50s, let's be honest. And uh, to communicate with people in their, in their teens and 20s on a one-to-one level is a huge generation gap. important. Yeah. Uh, when my parents were in their 50s, I... No way. No. And, of course, their precepts were completely... Yeah. And the thing I find is, one, that I'm amazing, but two, <laughs> uh, th- 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 that uh, I say to my wife, Don't they, doesn't everybody know these things? She goes, no, you're 101. You're, you're, you're the base course for yeah. pop culture that they need to hear. But kids will come to me and go, uh, I loved this book you recommended, or I loved, like... The Ohio Players, something yeah. as simple as a funk You've record. You've curated it, which we don't have. Right, and, th- and that's the thing. It's the curation. They, they go, now I have this. Now I see how fun it is and how... And the other thing that I always... I don't know if it's sad or good. People will write me and go, I can't get over that you're enthusiastic. Yeah. About things. You like stuff. The, 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 uh, you should see this, or yeah. you should watch this, or you should feel emotional about this, or yeah. you should understand that... War is bad. Yeah. It's not good. It's not something. It's not a natural. Yeah. And they'll go. I can't get over your enthusiasm for stuff. And I think, well, aren't people enthusiastic? Like, what are you doing? Right. But yeah. what are they doing? Yeah. That's my question. Well, there's a big difference, I think, between because Net- nothing means anything. Nothing means anything. There's a big difference between Netflix recommending things you might like and going to the video store and the clerk that you talk to yeah. every week who sees what you rent mm. says you would like this movie. On the surface, they seem like the same function. But they are completely different. And I don't want it to be triangulated, uh, Spotify style. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you go on your computer and uh, YouTube and I watch this YouTube and then it goes, well, you might like this. And it's like, no, those are commercial. That's a different thing. Those are commercial entities pushing commercial things. I liked this movie. I know your aesthetic or what I think your aesthetic is. I think you might like this thing you maybe haven't heard of. My wife and I have this discussion all the time and it it goes back to the age of bookstores and record stores and video stores. You'd go into a bookstore. When we were little kids, we frequented... I remember the old bookshop in the town I lived in, San Carlos, and, and the, the, the cat around the store had a, 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 a minor bird in a cage, yeah. which I thought was fascinating. But like, say you'd buy a book, yeah. like a, a, a Ray Bradbury book or something, yeah. then he'd go like, after a few times in, they didn't warm to you immediately. Yeah. Like you had to be a grown up about it. They treated you, you with- You earned it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They go, you know, since you bought this book, why don't you try this book right. by another author? And then you'd read that one and your mind would be expanded. Right. And that's exactly what you're talking about. I'm just reiterating what you said, but that's the difference is there isn't the friendly neighborhood. Like my wife's a music aficionado and a real, I don't like the word geek, but she's kind of a yeah. geek about she it. She bites the heads off chickens. Right. She, right. she works in a circus <laughs> yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, in a sideshow. Yes. And uh, She's a circus American. She, she said, you know, she was a 13-year-old girl and uh, all of her friends liked you know, whatever they like then, Tony Orlando and Dawn yeah. or, you know, crappy AM pop. And she's buying fucking Bob Dylan albums right. and Lou Reed and yeah. John Cale and, and like deeper, heavier. So she'd go to the record store. And of course, guys who work at record stores have never changed. It's always yeah. like high fidelity. It's, yeah. it's never been different. It's either young guys or middle-aged guys. Which is a comforting thing. Right. Who live in the world yep. of vinyl. And they are very snotty about their fucking precepts yeah. of what's good and what ain't good. Yeah, yep. we carry it, but only because we have to. Yeah. And it pays the bills. Right. Yeah. And then the kids come in and buy the shitty stuff, and they look at them, fine, here's yeah. that, that transaction, just one, I don't care. But when someone comes in, so she said she'd go to record stores, and she's a 13-year-old girl, and go, do you have Guts by John Cale? Who told you to ask for that? Right. <laughs> and they, all of a sudden, you found respect from yeah. these men. Yeah. And they're like, okay, well, if you like John Cale... Oh, no, we don't have it. We'll order it. Yeah. And then two weeks later, your phone rings. There's Scott Walker. Yeah. Yeah. We just got this in. Yeah. And so I miss that interaction, it's too. It's a chess game to right? get the keys to a certain right, level. Right, right. It's like a video game. But you, you, have have to, you have to fight for your right to freaking right. understand exactly. that the underground existed. There was right. an underground of records, movies, culture, pulp, this, this, this. That wasn't mean. You know, when I first lived in San Francisco, we would go to see, like, um, Russ Meyer movies. Yeah. And then I remember going to see Faster Also a World War II guy. Right. Oh, very much so. <laughs> yeah. And all he loved was tits, yep. baby. Just give me big tits. Tits and violence. And evidently was a, a really lovely... Yeah. Everyone said All the that. actresses who worked for him, no one ever said they were hard done by. Or well, there was no sex on, on no, set. No, no, he didn't chase No one was him. allowed. He didn't chase yeah. him, no. He, he didn't chase the girls. He forbid them from having sex yeah, at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah, he didn't. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, he was moralistic in yeah. that way. Uh, 
And I remember going to see like, um, it must have been in the 80, 81, Faster Pussycat at the Strand, which so it's was hard to see. Right, a great movie theater in San Francisco that I don't think it exists anymore. It's the sticky floors, homeless people lived in yeah. it. You know, I think it was two dollars to go. Yeah. We had the Mitchell Brothers. Thing right, right, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, a, a special showing, and for some reason, it showed at the Strand. I mean, you go upstairs and like, if you wanted to get a blow job, like yeah. there was a balcony that was basically the early learning center right. up there. Even if like, you didn't want to get one, it right? Just like if you you could sit <laughs> up there and smoke weed, which is why we do it. Yeah. And then of course guys would cruise you, and you'd be like, oh god, I don't, yeah. you know, I don't want to be. Just wanna watch I, this yeah, movie. I just want to get yeah. high and watch. Uh, 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 Pussy the cat. stuff. The stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Can't get enough. <laughs> and, the stuff. Uh, so, but I remember going to the Faster Pussycat thing, and there was five hundred people there. Yeah. Like the place was packed for yeah. it, and that was that kind of like. This is way before the internet, way before phones. This is an immediacy. Yeah, the crying need that all of us wanted to go see this fucking movie, yeah. and they never showed it in theaters. Like you said, it was a hard get. It's not playing you on TV. You couldn't get it on video then. You couldn't. Yeah. It wasn't playing on TV. It yeah. was never playing on TV. I don't think they played any Russ Meyer movies on TV up until probably Beyond the, the Valley of the Dolls would play occasionally, occasionally on cable. And it's such a freak show that... This is my happening, and it freaks me out. Yeah. And then, what's his name? Mike Myers ripped off all those lines from him yeah. and just took them wholesale. And Absolutely. You're a pretty groovy boy. And, all and that. Uh, our man Flint and all uh, that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. He, he pulled the Tarantino. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, we all do. Yeah, I mean, we do. We're craftspeople, but yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So there was, there was more of a. And so I kind of feel like I'm the old dude who works at the record store now. Yeah. But, uh, but we do it over the internet and we do it over the phone instead right. of you having to come and see me. But the, the difference is when I do live shows, people bring me stuff. And so I've been exposed to a whole yeah, wide world Yeah, it works of both shit. ways. Right. And so, you know, like the other night I got 5,000 poetry books and every other goddamn poets I haven't heard of, yeah. writers I haven't read. So I'm having to, you know, you run to furiously <laughs> ahead of the pack and yeah. try to tread water to like not get caught up. In. But that's exciting. It is. And I a lot of people the... don't want that, though. They want, no, they don't. They want, here's your, we'll mail you a box every month with the things you need to know. It's yeah. cliff notes. People right. want cliff notes. They don't want primary right. source stuff. And maybe it'll change and maybe it won't. But I think for, for guys like us, and it's not an elitist thing, I think we just have a passion for people who actually liked things. Yes. Guy who ran a bookstore liked books. Yeah. You know what I mean? A guy who ran a record store did it because he enjoyed records. Right. It wasn't right. just like, well, this is the only job I can get. Well, that, right. And that's what I find. So, you know, as show business disintegrates and splinters into, you know, warring factions and, and non entities, the best part is, of course, that we're allowed to do this and yes. that you can just about almost not make a living doing it. Yeah. It's, I don't it's lose a, as much money. Right. It's a bubble on that yeah. one. We haven't, you know, maybe. Maybe the top 10 podcasters make a living from it. Probably, yeah. And even they have to do live shows and stand-up and TV right. shows to supplement. And a lot of ads. Yeah, and take ads on. Uh, but the, uh, oh, God, I've lost my complete thread. My blood sugar's plummeting. <laughs> yeah, you probably need to eat here. some food. Um, uh, is, uh, um, it's the best of times and worst of times. Right, is, is that the people who run show business and that are in show business um, don't often care at all yeah. about entertainment or anything. They don't like actors and they don't like comedians in particular. They have to work with them and mm -hmm. they don't want to. And and they might as well work in a bank or what other financial yeah. things they could have come up with. They're bean counter types and there's no passion. Yeah. And that's... The antithesis of art. Right. But I mean, it was never different, obviously. Yeah. It's not like Samuel Goldwyn was some... He was a pure artist. Yeah, yeah magnificent yeah. human being who cared about people. Most of the old-time Hollywood producers just wanted to nail actresses and make movies. Yeah. They also didn't interfere as much in, in the uh, content up to you know the censorship point of view. But right. they, they let the filmmakers make the fucking movies as yeah. long as the movies made money. You're the chef. You know what you're doing. Right. Make the dinner and I'll sell it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, I, that's the thing that rubs me the wrong way in show business is when I meet, uh, particularly comedies, being in the comedy business, People who don't, who clearly don't like comedy, yeah, and they're in charge of it, and they'll tell you what's funny. Mm -hmm. it's not and funny. they sit with their corporate thing and look at you and judge you, and you think you don't even. You are intimidated because one, I'm giving off the vibe that I don't dig you, and yeah. I can't hide it because I'm not that good of an actor. Yeah. And secondly, you probably think I'm too, I'm gay, I'm too prissy, I'm too smart, I'm yeah. too esoteric, I'm too not mainstream. The things that make you interesting. <laughs> the things that make you right, like Oscar Wilde said. Yeah, uh, I remember years ago I was with an agent, and I don't do much t TV anymore. But I, I, uh, 
I was at a big agency that's a famous one in LA that represents a lot of comedians. And uh, there was a show on called, was it the Army Show? Brian Fassane yes, and Craig Ann were show. on and it. And it was uh, the Higgins Brothers were in it as yeah, well. Yeah, the Higgins yeah. Brothers were in it. Yeah. And, and then the Jamie Foxx show. That, so that'll give you an idea of what decade this is. And uh, I, uh, I booked both in one week. I went on auditions for both. Less small comedy parts on yeah, both. Played them as New York cab drivers. Right. Well, I was going to say, playing the usual. My other character is always a fruit bag, right? right. Like Because the way I look and act. Uh, I'm always an art critic. Or, uh, you know, yeah. Oh, mm. And, and uh, I booked both those shows. And I had to turn one down. I think we turned down the Army show to do the Jamie Foxx one. Right. And I went into the agent's office. And she was a, a reasonably intelligent woman. And she goes, what are we going to do with you? And I went, what do you mean? And she goes, boy, we got to think outside the box for you. And I went, I just booked you fucking mainstream. Yeah, I just made you money. Network shows in one week. What do you mean out of the box? Yeah. And it was because she couldn't get her head around that I talk this way and act this way. Right. That I'm not some sort of lantern jawed or I'm a regular, <laughs> you know, like a schlubby, you know, that everybody thinks a comedian is either Artie Lang or... Laugh at them. Right. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, 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 you know, and like... I love Louie for like being so keen and intelligent and insightful yeah. and emotional and bringing all that to the fucking table. Yeah. And because we live in the era we do finally, his show would have never been on network TV. Absolutely not. It wouldn't be then, it wouldn't be now. He would have been showing art movies at colleges. And being disgruntled. And people would have gone, what happened to this guy's career? Yeah. Instead, he's got an honest show that's really a reflection of People him. People watch it. That he is the most hands-on creator, yeah. writes, directs, edits. He's talking about the it. lenses that he's using. Yep. Yeah. I mean, he, it, it, it's fantastic. And yeah. that, that's the best change I yeah. can see. And that they had the good sense at FX to get the fuck out of his way. Yes. And, and once it was a hit, then they really got the fuck out of yes. his way. No one gets to take a year off. No. No one gets to take a year but, off. But... No one was doing that for decades, and it's happening again now. And back to you know what we were talking about at the beginning, as much as we've been complaining, there's the seeds of hope. Oh, very much so. And it could turn around, and it looks like it is in a lot of ways. I think so. Yeah. And also, I think people ask me about like, you know, because I'm older, the uh, comedy, this and that, and and I I'll never say it was better when I started. No. I, I just don't think it's true. Different. It was different. Um, uh, there's a more there's a more egalitarian thing now. Uh, the, the difference is, uh, you, you to be a live performer, you have to go through the process of uh, playing in dives, yeah, and and doing that for years and years and years until you're funny. That hasn't changed. But then of course there's the YouTube element now, right. and and people jumping right in and uh, uh, and all that. But at the same time, you're also learning your craft by doing that. Yeah, it's just a different medium. And so I don't, like, people go, was it better then or whatever? Because there was... There's different tools. Whoever, whatever comics were great. And, and I think, yeah. no, this is a golden age right now. And I'm pretty proud of my generation of comics because we're all around the same age. And, you know, I'm talking about uh, Patton Oswald and right. Mark Marin and Louis C.K. Dana and, Gould. And Dana Gould. Yeah. Like, these are all my contemporaries. Yeah. Or the, well, I consider myself in their... Yeah. in their class uh, 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 and, and, and Margaret Cho and Sarah and, and yeah. all the information and politics and passion and, and, and how much they care about it the, what they're doing so I, I feel like I could stand my class up with any with the yeah. Seinfeld uh, 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 Larry Charles I mean uh, Larry David yeah. uh, it's just a different Judy Tenuta Richard flavor. Belzer fucking yeah. Richard Lewis class or or the 60s class of, of Newhart and yeah. Phyllis Stiller, or, or you know, you go back to the 50s class of Mort Saul, Jonathan Winters, and, 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 and uh, um, uh, Bob Hope. And uh, Lenny <laughs> Bruce, who all started yeah. the same year in yeah. 52. Yeah. Like, there's always another wave coming. And of course, now there's so many brilliant comics in their 20s and 30s. Yeah. But the, one of the truths about comedy that I think is mostly true is you're, you're funnier. Uh, in, you're not as funny as a teenager and in your 20s as you get to be in your 30s and 40s. Because you're more of a fully formed person. Right, then you, your, your worldview's developed, yeah. your, your, your way of delivering's well, developed. That's what people always go, you're comfortable in yourself. Oh, it takes 10 years to get good at comedy. It's like, no, it's because you started comedy at 22 and it takes you 10 years to figure out who you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's when you can right. do art. 
Right, right. That's you've, what it is. Right, you have to know who you are. Yeah. Occasionally there's an Eddie Murphy, occasionally there's a Bo Burnham or whatever. Yeah, there's savants. Right, people spring fully blown, yeah. uh, you know, like there's the Beatles. Like yeah. Sometimes there's teenage rock stars who have everything at their command. Sometimes there's a, a an Anthony Arteau or a... a, yeah. a, 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 a you know, uh, Dylan Thomas, you, at, at 16, you're the greatest yeah. poet you're ever going but to be. You're never going to be better than that. Very rare. Very rare. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, I, I hate that um, person who came up with the theory. What is it called? What, you have to do 10,000 hours. And, oh, Malcolm Gladwell? Yeah, Malcolm I got Gladwell. quoted in the New York Times really? because I was the only person who would say something against that yeah, theory. Yeah, to refute that Because there was a comic who was doing a gimmick of, I'm going to do 10,000 hours of shows in a year and yeah. I'm a comic now. And I said, that is bullshit. Technical skill is not art. No. You go to Guitar Center right now, and every single one of those guys is going to play you Eddie Van Halen. Yeah. Not one of them can probably write a song, and that's why they're working at Guitar right. Center. You get the Ramones, day one, barely, just enough to be able to play yeah. a song, they're writing a song. It does not equal the thing. I said, no. if, you, if you can build a chair, it doesn't mean you can design an interesting one. It's totally different. No question. And I, I, it drives me insane. That that well, but the he's the kind of glib... Uh, political or, 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 or social philosopher that, that gets so much play now. Yeah. It's easy to digest for people. You know why? There's very clear rules. Yeah. 10,000 hours? You're, you yeah, have yeah, Right, and he came up with that bullshit number yeah. of 10,000 hours. Now you're an expert. Right, but it's like, no, you spend a lifetime. Yeah. We're, we're a guild, for better or worse, yeah. comics. And uh, people always think that, yeah, there's always petty jealousy and hatred. That's just humans. Uh, but by and large, we're, I, I use the word to encompass women as well, a fraternity. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because we all know what we have to do. And there's a shared experience. And we, yeah, we know the stakes of it and we know the disappointment and the highs of it. And so therefore we can relate to each other in a way that no one else and can. And we presumably went into comedy because we all share an, an interest in comedy. Yeah. Which right. I find isn't always the case now. No, no. There's people <laughs> who don't know anything about comedy that yeah. are comedians. They don't know who George Carlin or whatever. Right. And it's like, no, you have to understand. Not that you have to listen to every right. record ever made. But, but you don't have, you like things? <laughs> yeah, you have to understand what came before you in order yeah. to understand where the reason why we're allowed to say uh, cocksucker on stage, like people went to jail for this. Yeah, and oh, yeah. clubs were closed and lives were ruined and cabaret cards were taken and names were exchanged and court battles ensued yeah. and... Lawyers were thrown around, and like this isn't, uh, I mean, this is not the civil rights struggle, but, right. but the freedom of expression struggle never stops. There's weight to it. Yeah, there's and nothing, weight to and it. And nothing has a weight to it anymore. Yeah, there's weight to it. The, the, it's very important and serious that that Louis C.K. or whomever can get on TV and yeah. say the things they want to say. And then someone said to me years ago, and this is how little understanding people have of the media, uh, I, I've run into a little bit of censorship over the years doing stand-up on TV, right. which is a whole other egg, yeah. right? Uh, and I remember years ago on um, uh, the Craig Ferguson's show, and it wasn't Craig, because yeah. he's lovely. It was one of the producers. And he's a punk rock guy. Yeah, very much so. And so, of course, I relate to him. But he said, uh, the joke was, uh, we're afraid of the wrong people. Uh, we, we're afraid of young black men and we put them in jail. I'm more afraid of middle-aged white guys who run companies or whatever. That, that was the, some, yeah, some, yeah. I can't remember the whole joke. And he said, will you uh, change black men to urban? And I went, no, I won't because yeah. I don't speak in code. Yeah. I don't speak in corporate code and no one has ever called a black person an urban person. But and if you the do it, maybe they will. Right, but the presumption <laughs> that all black people live in an inner city yeah. And yeah. are standing next to a trash can. It's patronizing. Right, with a, with a fucking hoodie on. and like, yeah. what the fuck? So I said, no, I won't do it. And then, you know, my wife related it to a friend of ours. And she went, oh, I thought you could say whatever you wanted on TV. Yeah. I'm not kidding. And that was like two years ago. And you're a like... A lot of people think that. Uh, my, and my point about TV is, uh, it's the opposite of that. Absolutely. It, you're absolutely constricted to be able to not say what you want on TV. Yeah. Because they don't... If you could say what you wanted on TV, the lead story in the news would be... The rich have all the money and they're destroying the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Women are being raped and killed all the time by their boyfriends. Guns are out of control and they're wiping everyone out and there's no legal rules to fucking deal with this. Those would be the first stories. Not. No one would watch Is that. your grandmother a time bomb? Yeah. <laughs> are your legs restless? Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> we'll find out. So after this. I, I. Yeah. It's getting people to kind of understand and, like you say, think about it, analyze maybe. Yeah. Um, critical thinking. 
it's okay if they hate stuff because now they're thinking about it. And if no. they can say, why do I hate this? Right. They might come to a revelation. Uh, maybe it's because you lived in England as well, but I, I found this to be very true in England and the biggest difference, not so much anymore because the English are dumbed down as much as we are, Yeah. Uh, which is disappointing. I've found that English crowds have gotten, and I played there for 25 years, stupider. Uh, they have here too, but they do have in England and when they, they used would to have much you more in England, of. it would be very pointed. Oh my God. Be, Devastating. I've, I've listened to your act. I've digested yes, it yes. and I've found a logical hole that right, I don't agree right. with. And now they're just like, fuck you. Uh, oh, I fuck off. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's, uh, they, they're, they're from a reference for stuff. I remember talking about Paul McCartney on one of the podcasts about a year ago. And literally the crowd didn't fucking know any of his songs. Well, I think here's And I thought, well, am I just that old? Yeah. Well, I think an interesting thing I've noticed about England as opposed to here is that in the 80s, they had that alt revolution with all the comic strip guys. And they became the mainstream. Right. That was their main... When we had airplane food people, their mainstream was this punk rock fucking weird right, Alexi Sale, Alexi Sale yeah, aesthetic yeah. and because that was the mainstream I feel like it's come all the way around and you now have people doing impersonal hateful one liner type stuff there yeah. more than and you your were, Michael McIntyre yeah. and your Sarah Millicans <laughs> the, all my, that anodyne my favorite thing about, shit and I'm not blaming those guys no no but don't just, anybody call me and just talk and shift, tell me that I hate it's just them. a shift in the they're culture. commercial comics yeah and yeah. that's their shtick, and there's no crime in that. My favorite thing Vic Reeves did uh, was, he was actually doing a Peter Kay yeah. thing, but he goes, he was doing a, a take on that, and he goes, remember old-fashioned pants? You put them on, you took them off. Yeah. Old-fashioned pants. Yeah. And I'm like, that's kind of what people are watching now. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting to see, you know, it's almost like the hippie parents making a conservative kid. Oh, Except yeah. the culture has done that with yeah, comedy. Yeah. There. Well, uh, uh, what I was going to say was, in, in England, uh, uh, the difference is, in America, people say, I think I read something somewhere. Yeah. Or I feel this way. Right. Facts don't matter. I know how I feel. Yeah. And it, what I found when I lived in England was if you expressed an opinion. Back it up. Back it up. And you were forced to. Yeah. In a cocktail party atmosphere, in a bar, wherever you were, people didn't just blindly accept the stupid shit that came no. out of your mouth. If I remember my wife said something like, uh, corporations run the world or something at a party and a guy went oh do they yeah and broke it down on her cite how, your sources uh-huh how what if you lived in this situation yeah. you wouldn't feel that way and right. what if you and she had to fucking acquiesce and i realized then that i you've got to back it up yeah because you were put on the spot too and also when i lived in there in the, in the 90s that the papers were so important yeah because of page page three, right? <laughs> Which finally I think is gone. It's gone now. Yeah, it, it took till this year. Yeah, uh, um, but I would get asked because I lived there and I was on telly and whatnot, and I was part of the alternative comedy yeah. scene. We want your point of view. Yeah, they would ask me to write a piece on this or that, and you were expected to be able to acquit yourself on paper. Yeah, and I don't mean like. I went to a bar and I got drunk no. and a dog got on me. And I'm I writing I a college essay, essentially. Right, right. Yeah. You had to make a point. You had to fucking do this. You had to do that. You're a communicator for a living. You should be able to do right. it on paper. So I ended up writing all these pieces for magazines and newspapers when I was over there. And I thought, no one ever asks me to do it here. No. They don't care. I mean, I finally I wrote a book or whatever. But like most comedians' books are memoirs or, or, or schlockfest transcripts of their act or, or road Basically, stories yeah. or how they got laid or yeah. whatever and that's fair enough that's what comedy is too yeah. I, I don't denigrate it in any way but like to be able to acquit yourself on a topic and, and back your shit up that's a skill set that a lot of people don't have well I mean and so because they're like, not forced to no on the podcast I, I, I'm a little bit lazy about it but mostly I try to when I cite something or start a subject, I'll say, this is from The Guardian UK. This yeah. is from Fox News. Yeah. And I'll often go, excuse me, this is the byline. It was written by this person. Yeah. Now you can go look at it for yourself if you want to. You mean to. you attribute things? Always. <laughs> I, I, I think attributing is astoundingly yeah. important and uh, uh, knowing where the sources, because people write me all the time and they'll ask the simplest questions like, where should I go to look for news? Yeah. But people don't have context. Because they're overwhelmed with, yeah. you know. Context has been lost in our day-to-day -day society, and that's a bad thing. And 
we need it back. Yeah. <laughs> we need context. And we don't need a uh, free floating context that can be whatever you need the context to be at that time. Right. And that's why people get offended so easily because there's no oh. context. Yeah. That's why people can say, but I think this way because there's no context. That's why the truth doesn't yeah. isn't a definitive thing because context is yeah. gone. And it, it, I think it has to come back because you can't have less context than we have now and and do anything. <laughs> I know. I hope I hope it does. I mean that's what I find about like your I know this is an obvious choice, but like Bill O'Reilly and Rush Lamar, right. those bl- the you know, those types, those clowns. Yeah, the, they know what they're doing. Well it's all show business. Yeah. And they don't really have any convictions or yeah. anything. But they never cite sources or facts. They don't need to. They don't need to. And their audience doesn't want them to. It's ask for forgiveness, not permission. Right. It's right? Let it out and go, well, we said it, so let's do it instead yeah, yeah, of being yeah. like, yeah. Oh, women all do this, or yeah. black people do this, or yeah. uh, uh, they shouldn't resist arrest. Yeah. That kind of nonsense. Yeah. And you're like, you, that's not empirically valid in any yeah. way, and uh, yet it gets flowed out there. It's black and white. And that, Yeah, and that's why I'm always... I try to be meticulous. Uh, occasionally, I get too high and forget where I fucking found it. <laughs> but uh, I, I'll always try to, and and I'll use right wing sources as well. Yeah. And when I say right wing, I mean things like Time Magazine, like the mainstream thing. Yeah. But I will go to Fox News. Sometimes I'll have the fun of like a story will come up, and I'll go immediately to Fox News to see, see what, what their, their angle is. Yeah, to I do see that all how the they time. spin it. Yeah. Because, but I don't understand like the people who don't. <laughs> like you said, they cherry pick their news because they want to be reinforced yeah. to what they know is right. I'm as guilty of as anyone. Yeah. I get, when I read something, everybody is you're human. Yeah. No one's purely objective. But I think uh, the fun of it is to go to a, a bunch of sources and see how they all took on it. Yeah, and then and I don't mean opinion. I mean like what's supposedly supposed right. to be news reporting. You want to rush them on it, right? You know so what you I mean. Get a different points of yeah. view. And, it's uh, basically we live in a world where Rashomon is one movie. Yeah, with just one of the stories, people go. Nah, you go, you can pick one of these ten. Right, you can't watch all of them. And they're all they're all true if you want them to be. Yeah, if you feel like they're true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Greg, I don't want you to starve to death. So but, oh thank you God. so much. I don't. It was great talking to you. Thank you for doing this. This is a three-hour show. It is. This is our longest episode ever. Oh my God. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Thank you. Holy cow! I have to go on. Oh, baby, I, I see you in my- and there you go that was greg proops uh as i said the longest episode we've done thus far i'm pretty sure that if you are currently in college it will count as probably at least four credits for you i don't know give it a shot let me know if it works out uh and as always please email me at ken at icanread.com or at tvguidancecounselor at gmail.com love to hear from you uh we have a new episode every wednesday so make sure you subscribe and rate the show review the show on itunes if you like it it's a huge help and we'll see you again next week on an all-new episode of tv guidance council Sometimes there's no good guy. Oh, you really think this? If history's taught us one thing, it's that anyone can be murdered. Get your news on. (laughs) That, I feel, is a gross violation of the human contract. It's like running someone over in a crosswalk.